Excited for Agenda 17? Sean's excited. So that's that's what matters. Where so, did the first 16 go? It's like it's been so much fun. It's it like feels, that. Just like that. Just like that. I'm always excited. We had a we had an interesting ARAC meeting once and it was agenda 21 and just with the people with the speakers at the committee and the fear of agenda 21. It just worked out so well at that time. That was last term account. So this is a new term and we're well into it. So let's get at it. Uh, so welcome to the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management, the latter of which we will deal with today. Uh, I see we have quorum, but I will ask Christopher just to do a roll call for fun. Absolutely. Certainly, Chair. Councillor Brockington. I don't believe he's joined yet. Councillor Cloutier. Present. Councillor Deruz. Here. Councillor Eglai. Here. Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor King. Here. Councillor McKinney. Present. And Vice Chair Menard. Here. And Chair Moffat. I am also here as evidenced by the fact that I've already spoken. So thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate that. I will keep an eye out for Councillor Brockington. Yes, don't let him get trapped in waiting room purgatory. He put his hand up and no one will notice. Devastating. So declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Pecuniary? Non-pecuniary? Any? None. Okay. Confirmation of minutes from agenda 16, the meeting of Monday, May 17th, 2021. Are those Carried. meetings carried? Are those, <laughs> are those minutes carried? Carried. Carried. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we have four items on the agenda today and we will be adding a fifth item. I believe there's a motion coming to do so just a verbal presentation on something. Um, our first item is solid waste master plan phase two. We will hold that for presentation and delegations. Uh, item number two is Solid Waste Services 2023 Residential Curbside Collection Contract Procurement Strategy, which we do have a presentation on that as well. Item three is Source Water Protection Plan Amendment for the new Kempville Municipal Well System. In case you haven't noticed, I annexed Kempville. I know you didn't, I didn't tell any of you. I didn't feel I had to, but I've annexed Kempville. This is a part of that. Um, so we have a, a motion that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend Council endorse the proposed amendment under Section 34 of the Clean Water Act to revise the Mississippi Rito Source Protection Plan to add a, a new municipal well system for the municipality of North Grenville into the Mississippi Rito Source Protection Plan and assessment reports. Um, so as you know, we, we have a source protection plan for uh, the various municipal well systems that exist in the city. North Grenville's municipal well systems also extend the, the protection area also extends into the city of Ottawa. Uh, so we must um, make sure we have those proper updates done to reflect that. Um, so on that item, can we carry that? Okay. Carried. Carried. Thank you very much. Item number four is from our revenue group. It's a general accounts, water, wastewater, and stormwater write-offs. That the sure. State, yeah. yeah um, just to let you know that there is a technical motion that has to be uh, this moved for this one, just to change yes. the ACS number. Very important. So, I'll ask Councilman. It's a it's a report on. It's receiving a report on the 2020 general accounts right off for the years 2010 to 2011, of 302,461 dollars is required by the delegation of authority by law. But I'll ask Councilman Menard to move that technical motion to change the number on the report. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I've got it in front of me here. Uh, we can put it on the screen too, it'd be helpful. Um, uh, whereas ACS uh, uh, was number ACS 2021 FSD REV 0004 was previously reviewed 
for the residential vacant unit tax report that was considered by the Finance and Economic Development Committee at its meeting of June 1st, 2021, and subsequently by Council on June 9th, 2021. Therefore, be it resolved that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water, and Waste Management approve um, SEP WWM uh, Agenda 17, Report Number 4, pertaining to general accounts, water, wastewater, and stormwater write offs be renumbered as ACS 2021 FSD REV 0005. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? I'd be willing to waive the five minute rule if we I wanted kind to. I knew you were going yeah. to do that. Maybe we should let the Council of Minnesota read it again. <laughs> Are we okay with 0005? Zero, 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 do we want to jump ahead to 0006? Zero, 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 Just we're good. Okay. So on the motion, Aaron. any questions on the, I don't want to, um, if we have questions on this report, I do want to do it now because I don't want to hold up our financial services staff uh, unnecessarily for the other piece. So any questions on this, on this report at all? Uh, seeing none. So can we receive this report as amended by the received. motion? Received. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And do we have the motion written out yet on the additional item or should I just get to it later? Uh, uh, Mr. King? Uh, we're just completing that uh, chair and, okay. uh, and no we understand as well that uh, Councilor Menard would be interested in discussing this uh, item. So uh, we also wanted just to confirm uh, whether the vice chair would be willing to second the, the motion. Well, but we no will need be for, circulating it uh, relatively soon. Yeah, no need for a seconder at committee. Um, so that's fair. So we'll, we'll come back to that after we do the items one and two. Essentially, it's an update on the situation surrounding gypsy moths, um, which have been plaguing certain neighborhoods uh, in the city and beyond. Uh, okay. So with that, we will jump right into item one which is the solid waste master plan phase two. Uh, thank you. I know over 15 off at least 15 offices were represented at the technical briefing that we held on the 18th of June. So really appreciate your attendance there. I know many of you, several of you asked questions at that, at that time as well. And hopefully you had a chance to review the, the report. I believe it was 465 pages of it. So I'm sure you couldn't put it down. Uh, so thank you uh, again. Thank you. I mean, those those technical briefings are an important piece to what we do here, and it it certainly helps uh, prepare for the discussion at committee. Uh, so with that, I will hand it off to Shelley McDonald and Nicole Hoover Bianash. And Riley's here. Hi, Riley. I felt like I need to announce whenever someone's late, like you always just have to single them out and announce I was it. Knocking on the door, trying to get in. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't hear you. It's probably because I'm in North Court, but, uh, but thank you for coming. All right, go ahead, Shelley Nicole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, committee members. This morning, Nicole Hoover, BNS, and I will provide a shortened version of the presentation given during the technical briefing for phase two of the Solid Waste Master Plan on June the 17th. Today's presentation will include a brief overview of background on the Master Plan's development and where we are at today. Overview of the recommended strategic framework for the master plan and the key work undertaken to date in phase two, including the city's future waste needs and options to address the needs. Finally, next steps on the waste plan development process. Also joining us today to assist with answering any questions members of committee may have are Kevin Wiley, General Manager, Public Works and Environmental Services, and three core members of the HDR and Dillon Technical Consulting Team supporting the master plan's development. Beth Godger, Waste Management Consultant with Dillon Consulting, Larry Fedick, Solid Waste Program Lead with HDR Consulting, and Betsy Varghese, Technical Services and Project Lead with Dillon Consulting. Next slide, please. This image helps articulate how far we've come thus far in the waste planning process. As Council will recall, staff brought forward the road wrap roadmap report for the Solid Waste Master Plan in July 2019. This approved report outlined the framework for the development of the city's Solid Waste Master Plan, which will guide how Ottawa manages and diverts waste over the next 30 years, and specifically outlined the proposed three-phased approach 
for developing the master plan based on municipal best practices. Through the roadmap report, Council also approved the establishment of the Councillor Sponsors Group for the Waste Plan and its component projects, which staff have and continue to leverage for support and guidance throughout the waste planning process. Council also approved a three series approach for public and stakeholder consultation and engagement throughout the master plan's development. In the middle of 2020, staff received the phase one report, which provided council with a baseline of information for discussion and consideration in future phases, and also informed council of what tools are available to influence the city's waste management system and programs. With council's receipt of phase one, staff moved into phase two and began our first series of discussions with the community and our key stakeholders to help inform the development of the proposed vision, goals, and guiding principles that will provide a framework for the waste plan. That important feedback was instrumental for developing phase two technical deliverables, including informing the identification of the city's future waste management needs, the long list of available options to meet those needs that also align with proposed vision, goals, and guiding principles and the development of an evaluation process that will be used to assess options and narrow them down to a short list of options suitable for Ottawa. This brings us to where we are today in the master planning process, providing members of council with an update on the work done to date in phase two, seeking council approval of the waste plans proposed vision goals and guiding principles. I will now pass things over to Nicole for the rest of the presentation. Next slide, please. Right, well, thank you so much, Shelley, Chair Moffat, and good morning, uh, members of committee. So moving into the purpose of today's presentation, the phase two report recommendations are twofold. So first, this report uh, um, presents council with the proposed vision, guiding principles, and goals that will set the overarching strategic framework for how the city will manage solid waste, increase diversion, and work towards extending the life of the Trail Road Landfill over the next 30 years. <clears throat> So these proposed, proposed strategic elements of the waste plan were developed, as uh, Shelley had uh, touched on, in collaboration with the general public and key stakeholders, as well as our project stakeholder sounding board and our project's council sponsors group. So this approach was undertaken to ensure that the strategic framework um, and direction for the plan would be reflective of community beliefs and values, um, honoring ultimately the commitment that we made to council to develop this plan in unison with the community. So in terms of why we're seeking council's approval of these key strategic elements at this point in the waste plans development is to ensure that council's strategic priorities are defined to guide the work to follow in phase two and phase three. As we work to develop the draft and final waste plan that's going to align and work to achieve council's direction and vision for the future of waste management over the next 30 years. So secondly, this report also provides members of council with an update on progress to date in the development of phase two of the waste plan. Uh, so this includes an overview of the key technical work undertaken in phase two, including the city's future waste management needs, um, gaps, constraints, and opportunities, along with a high level list of options available to meet the future needs. Um, and that also worked to support the goals of the waste plan or the proposed goals of the waste plan and the triple bottom line technical evaluation process that will be used to evaluate and shortlist the options for community and stakeholder engagement this fall. Next slide, please. So Shelley had highlighted earlier, extensive engagement underpinned all elements of this report. Staff worked with the council sponsors group and stakeholders, both internal and external to the city and members of the public to ensure that each aspect of the, uh, this particular phase of the waste plan has incorporated and aligned with council and community priorities and feedback. So during engagement series one, uh, which took place last spring and into last winter, staff undertook a robust engagement approach to ensure broad-based community engagement. Um, and we're seeking that to provide input into developing the proposed vision, goals and guiding principles, as well as helping identify the future needs and pro providing input into identifying a long list of options to meet those needs. So the tactics for engagement series one were designed in a way to encourage participation and reach a broad range of residents. Um, this included key stakeholder workshops, surveys, online dialogue sessions, and an online survey for the general public, uh, virtual focus groups, and one-on-one -on -one interviews with equity seeking groups. We used a variety of promotion tools, including advertising, social media, earned media, and also working with um, our 
broad base of stakeholders and community associations and agencies to reach out to their various networks and, and encourage uh, participation. So staff did, of course, have to plan, um, adjust our planned activities or engagement activities because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which um, moving everything online instead of in person. So we received comments from over 2,800 participants, whether through surveys, online meetings, emails, and comments on Engage Ottawa. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So the long-term strategic vision for the waste plan that staff are proposing is a zero waste Ottawa achieved through progressive, collective, and innovative action. So zero waste is considered a philosophy and a call to action rather than an absolute target. And it seeks to guide people in changing their lifestyles and practices, focusing more heavily on waste prevention, reduction, reuse, and recycling over disposal. Um, I want to highlight that it is generally recognized by policymakers that achieving zero waste does require concerted effort in coordination between all levels of government, as well as industry, businesses, and consumers. So something we won't alone as a municipality be able to achieve without that collaboration. So at the municipal level, this means that the community and the city will need to rethink the traditional approach of managing waste to create, to creating and supporting opportunities to work towards eliminating waste by recognizing that the materials that are traditionally discarded of and sent to landfill are in fact valuable resources. I just want to highlight as well, especially given some of um, I think the conversations in the community over the past couple of weeks is important to recognize that even with a strong focus on waste avoidance, reduction, reuse, recycling, and recovery, that there will always be a need to manage what's left in the residual stream. And you see this, of course, emphasized in the different options and the needs um, analysis. So the eight guiding principles that are being recommended to clearly define what's important for success and will inform the development and implementation of the waste plan. So these guiding principles were identified and emphasized as important by both the community and key stakeholders. They speak to honoring the five R's of the waste management hierarchy, seeking to change community values related to waste. So again, recognizing that achieving the plan's goals will take a concerted effort by the community in partnership with the city. Protecting the environment for future generations to come, leading by example and encouraging the adoption of circular economy principles which replace the conventional linear waste management approach of take, make, dispose to a take, make, return model. So creating a closed loop system where valuable natural resources are kept in cycle instead of being disposed of the landfill. So 11 goals are being recommended for council consideration, which will define the outcomes council wants to achieve through the waste plan. So helping transition the vision from a broad statement to more specific direction. So they're focused on extending the life of the trail waste facility, reducing waste generation, reusing more waste, recycling more, recovering more materials and energy from the garbage stream, and aspiring to reduce the city's waste management system's greenhouse gas emissions by 100%, aligning with Council's climate change targets. They also look um, to work with other sectors in the community to reduce, reuse, and divert waste to maximize participation in waste management programs and services, minimizing costs to municipal taxpayers, and making sustainable waste management design an essential part of the city's planning process. Um, and last but not least, collaborating with external stakeholders to advance waste management practices. So with council's approval of the waste plan's vision statement, guiding principles and goals, staff will be well positioned to continue to work towards developing the draft and final waste plan that will align and work to achieve council's direction and vision for the future waste management over the next 30 years. Next slide, please. So moving to the second part of the staff report, um, which is to provide um, council and members of the public and key stakeholders with key pieces of information developed during phase two that will underpin the development of the master plan and form the basis for the important discussions to come with the community in terms of the needs that the master plan must address, what options can be considered to meet the needs and how far and how fast and at what cost we want to move towards achieving the goals of the plan. So understanding how the city's population and waste management needs may change over the next 30 years, of course, is fundamental in helping ensure council can make effective and efficient decisions about waste management programs and services and plan for the proper supporting infrastructure programs uh, and contracts into the future. 
So I know as members of committee and council are familiar, the new official plan projects that uh, Ottawa will have a population of more than 1.4 million by 2046. So these additional residents, along with waste generation rates and industry trends, will impact the quantity and composition of waste that the city will need to manage into the future. So overall, it is anticipated that the city will need to manage uh, just over 487,000 tons of waste in 2052. So this represents about 37% more waste than in 2020. Like today, single family households are projected to continue to generate the largest proportion of waste. So up to three quarters of all waste in 2052. So this uh, being followed by the multi-residential properties that you'll see here on this slide, predicted to generate about 18% of the total amount of waste, city facilities nearly 7%, and parks and public spaces generating uh, just under 1% of the overall amount of waste in 2052. Um, a couple of things that I just wanna highlight when taking a look at um, these projections is that um, there are a number of factors that can affect the amount of waste that is generated. So the model that was used to develop the waste projections is based on historical um, as well as current information. And it doesn't impact, or sorry, it doesn't consider the impact of COVID-19, given the ongoing uncertainty in terms of the pandemic's impact on the future types, as well as the quantity of waste requiring management by the city. I think this further underscores the importance that the master plan has been developed in a way to remain flexible and adaptable to some of the shifts and changes within the industry. Um, and this, of course, is something that we will continue to monitor closely and we'll be updating the model um, waste projections on a regular basis as the waste plan is refreshed every five years, um, which, of course, is considered an industry best practice approach. Next slide, please. So with an understanding of Ottawa's future waste projections, the Waste Plan's technical consulting team began to identify future needs, high-level gaps, constraints and opportunities, as well as its associated timing. So uh, whether these are um, needs that we should be working to address in the short term, the medium term, or the long term. So overall, um, 21 anticipated future needs were identified that touch on all of the various components of the integrated waste management system. So they're broken down into the seven categories that you see here on the slide. And they range, um, as an example, they speak to opportunities to enhance waste reduction reuse efforts, securing future organics capacity beyond the existing current contract we have in place, all the way to exploring options to extend the life of the trail road landfill, while also planning for new disposal capacity when required. The needs identification process explored the potential for enhancement to existing programs and policies. It identifies new opportunities and where existing contracts are about to expire, it looks at the potential to do something different than we're doing today. And of course, the, the needs were identified through our technical consulting team um, who considered the waste projections, our most recent waste audit data, and all the extensive research undertaken in phase one when identifying the future needs. Um, we also considered feedback from city councillors city staff and through consultations with stakeholders and residents. So we also considered climate or council's climate change goals and targets and the energy evolution strategy, which identified three projects specific to the waste sector. So transitioning to an electrified fleet, developing a strategy to recover resources from organic waste and developing a strategy to generate renewable natural gas from waste. So some of the future needs um, that we've seen identified in the needs analysis are already being addressed by staff through some of our ongoing waste plan component projects. Um, we provided a detailed um, update in the phase two report, but specifically I just wanted to highlight the curbside diversion options project, um, which is exploring regulatory tools to increase diversion and encourage participation in, in diversion programs for curbside households. So engagement on this project is set to begin uh, later this summer with the aim to bring forward a recommended policy for council consideration early Q1 or in Q1 of next year. Also, the ongoing development of a multi-residential diversion strategy is also underway with plans to engage the community and stakeholders this fall, while also bringing forward the strategy for council consideration early next year. So other city plans are also um, underway to actively address some of the future needs, um, including the development of a solid waste services long range financial plan, 
what's going to help um, ensure long-term financial sustainability of the solid waste management system. And we'll consider kind of the inputs from the final waste or the final master plan once developed. Next slide, please. So in addition to the needs identified through the needs assessment, there are a number of key considerations and risks that were also identified that have the potential to impact long-term waste management uh, needs in the city that of course need to be uh, considered as we continue to develop the master plan. So one of the key considerations for the waste plan will be the life of the Trail Road landfill, which of course is an important community asset and um, is reflected as a fundamental consideration in the waste plan. I'm going to touch on it in a little bit more detail on the next slide. There are also a number of regulatory changes that are happening at both the provincial and federal levels that will affect how Ottawa manages waste. Um, as an example, at the provincial level, some waste diversion programs, such as the transition to individual producer responsibility, and the Ontario Food and Organic Waste Framework, including the proposal for a province-wide um, ban on organics and landfills, which will undoubtedly impact the waste Ottawa is responsible to manage and will influence the development of the waste plan. Um, so it's also impacting um, the consideration of different op options that we'll be looking at to respond to this changing legislation. Climate change, of course, is another area that has implications on the city and its waste management system, including that of climate resiliency. Um, it will impact the probability of severe weather events, um, including floods, tornadoes, which can impact collection, uh, transportation, processing and the disposal of materials impacted by those um, events, as well as the amount of waste that's generated. Um, as previously noted, there, there are a number of factors that can affect the amount of waste that is generated. And these include things such as changes in lifestyle and consumer trends, uh, a change that we've most recently seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. So some of these may not come to fruition before we finalize the waste plan for council's consideration, which means that we will likely need to be, or they will likely need to be addressed in future updates to the waste plan. Um, so this of course further emphasizes the importance of the plan itself remaining flexible and adaptable and being refreshed every five years to meet uh, the city's needs and to be resilient as these risks and considerations continue to evolve and present um, various implications for our future waste management system. Next slide, please. So extending and optimizing the capacity of the trail road landfill was identified as a future need through the needs analysis process and reflected in the proposed goals of the solid waste master plan. Recognizing that this is an important community asset, um, especially in light of the overall or the fact that overall landfill capacity available across the province is diminishing. Um, most recent estimates highlight that the province wide landfill capacity could be diminished within the next 15 years. So it's estimated that there's approximately 30% capacity remaining at the landfill. So this in conjunction with staff's review of disposal trends um, determined that if the city remains status quo with regards to waste reduction and diversion, the trail waste facility is expected to reach capacity between 2036 and 2038. So giving us about 15 to 17 years of remaining uh, life if nothing is done to further reduce and divert more waste from landfill. So while it might seem like a fair amount of time, um, it can take up to 15 years to develop a new landfill or implement an alternative waste management technology. And this takes into consideration uh, provincial approval processes as well as uh, city planning approval processes and of course engagement with the community. So this underscores of course the importance of action needing to play place now. But um, staff do, however, we are confident that this council is well positioned in terms of time and ability to preserve and extend the landfill's remaining capacity and to uh, prolong its useful life. So as such, um, staff are proposing that more aggressive actions identified through the master planning process to date be advanced under a residual waste management strategy that will be undertaken in the short term to do everything possible to preserve and extend the life of the trail road facility landfill in concert um, with the continued development of the solid waste master plan. So staff do intend on bringing forward a roadmap report to develop the residual management strategy in Q3 of this year. 
And we envision that the strategy will analyze options um, aimed at preserving capacity and extending the life of the trail waste facility landfill, um, which have been identified through the master planning process. Um, so as an example, uh, it will consider options such as those listed on the slide here, including banning items from disposal, um, as an example, um, construction and demolition waste that are typically difficult to compact, increase in tipping fees, um, landfill expansion and optimization opportunities, and opportunities to dispose of waste at private sector landfills. So by advancing this work concurrent to the development of the Solid Waste Master Plan, in conjunction with the work that it's already under a way to explore additional curbside and multi-residential diversion options to implement in the short term. Um, as the waste planning process continues, again, staff are confident that, that council will be equipped with the necessary information in order to be able to um, take swift and meaningful action in extending the life of the trail road landfill. Next slide, please. So at this point in the planning process, um, over 70 options have been identified to meet the city's future needs and align with the proposed vision, goals, and guiding principles. The high-level options proposed in the long list were identified uh, by a number of different sources and were developed through an evidence-based research approach. So the options development considered um, the extensive research that was conducted in phase one and furthered by, uh, further supplemented by additional research in phase two. Um, feedback we've received from our council sponsors group and members of council based on knowledge and feedback um, that you've received from constituents, general public um, and project stakeholders um, that feedback received through engagement series one, and also input received from the city champions working group um, and city staff based on their knowledge of the city, um, as well as synergies with other city strategies. So specifically through engagement series one, staff solicited input and ideas from key stakeholders and residents in terms of the types of options that they wanted to see considered by the city as the waste plan is developed. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to touch quickly as well um, and note that many of the options that, that you've seen in the staff report do build upon one another um, or they have interdependencies with other options that would be needed in order to achieve a successful outcome. Um, so just to give an example, um, one of the options in the long list is anaerobic digestion of organics and creating uh, biogas from that. So this option has been identified in the needs analysis as an opportunity to process organic waste differently once the city's organics processing contract ends in 2030. This option helps to achieve the proposed goals um, to maximize waste recovery goals and it also aligns with the city's climate change goals um, and would enable the city to generate renewable natural gas from the organic waste stream. So this type of processing technology, however, can only manage certain feedstocks as an example, food waste. Um, and because of that, um, separate leaf and yard waste collection would be required to manage leaf and yard waste if this option is considered further. So this would represent a change uh, for residents who are used to being able to place their leaving yard waste in the city's green bin program, requiring additional outreach and education and pro promotion. Um, and it could also, um, it's likely to impact other city infrastructure. So as an example, including the need to expand and find additional processing capacity for leaf and yard waste. So these are just some examples of the system dependencies that highlight that not each option can be considered in isolation. And that's why we developed the option templates in the staff report to document and detail all those different interdependencies and important key considerations. So the financial, social, and environmental implications of each of the options are also important considerations that have been documented for the options, but they were also designed, uh, or we designed the options templates to also consider the options, understanding which options require a change to public behavior and how we can benchmark and measure the performance of the options um, and also different regulatory considerations. So depending on the option, certain regulatory considerations will likely impact how quickly an option can be considered for implementation. Um, we've also focused um, identifying which options rely heavily on public behavior change. Um, which will, of course, impact how quickly we can, uh, we may be able to achieve success with some of the options. Um, as members of committee and council are well aware, 
Behaviors are often linked to longstanding habits and core beliefs um, that have been ingrained in individuals throughout the course of their lives. So um, we've experienced this most recently with changes to the Green Bin program. So we've seen preliminary positive results in the first year um, after that policy change, um, but there's still a long way to go in terms of encouraging additional uh, participation. So all of these key considerations and factors will not only be important inputs um, as part of the options evaluation and shortlisting process, which I'm going to touch on shortly, but they'll also form the basis for community consultation on developing the plan. So as part of the next phase of engagement, we will be asking the community how many of these options they will be willing to adopt at what cost in order to achieve the plan's goals. Um, you know, garbage touches everyone in the community. Um, and the success of this plan will rely on our collective efforts as a community to change. Um, and we, of course, need to know from um, members of the public and key stakeholders how much and how fast uh, change um, we can undertake to be um, to successfully implement the waste plan. Um, we are confident that the list of options um, is wholesome, includes feasible high level options options for the city to consider in short, medium, and long term, um, and that they align with the city's future needs and the proposed vision, guiding principles, and goals for the strategy. I just wanted to highlight as well that over the next 30 years, options that the city considers will evolve. Um, some will be added, some will be removed, um, some may be put on hold, and that's all in an effort to make sure that the plan remains adaptable to ensure that meeting the city's man waste management needs is responding to emerging trends um, and changes within the um, waste management industry. So as technologies evolve, um, as we uh, learn the results of different pilots, we introduce um, new programs and change um, in the evolution of industry best practices, staff will continually work um, in concert with members of council in the community to identify new options to consider as the waste plan is refreshed every five years. Next slide, please. So with council's approval of the waste plan's vision statement, guiding principles and goals, um, staff will begin the options evaluation process and work towards developing the draft waste plan and five-year implementation study. Um, as council will recall from the approved master plan roadmap report, now that the city's anticipated future needs um, for the next 30 years and the long list of options available to meet those needs have been identified, the technical consulting team will evaluate each of the options to narrow them down to a short list of options for Ottawa that will then be taken to the community and stakeholders for input this fall. And the evaluation process and the technical tool was developed by the project's technical consulting team. Um, it considered best practices and approaches used in other municipal waste planning processes. Um, also considered key council approved lenses that form the basis of the triple bottom line. Um, the technical evaluation process includes a three-step process to ensure an effective, efficient, and transparent process um, that's outlined here on the slide. First, options will be screened using a series of questions. And second, a triple bottom line evaluation will be done on the options that pass through the screening step. The, um, the tool itself um, will use an equally weighted approach to assess and balance various health and social, environmental sustainability, and financial viability considerations to ensure that the short list of options suitable for Ottawa's future waste management needs balances these multiple considerations. Um, and this structured approach will allow us to compare different options based on this consistent set of criteria um, that reflects stakeholder priorities. And it's gonna help us determine which options offer the greatest potential value to the city. And so once all of those options have been screened and evaluated, the short list of highest ranking options that align with the city's needs um, and the master plan's vision, guiding principles and goals will be developed. And they'll be grouped into one of three categories and used to, um, build two different future waste management systems. So one moderate and one aggressive. And the reason for grouping the options into these systems is because as I had highlighted earlier, many of the options depend on other supporting options to ensure success. So we wanna be able to show the community that more holistic perspective of how the options work together towards trying, uh, working towards achieving the goals of the master plan. Um, these systems will be compared against each other, the status quo uh, with respect to waste diversion potential, GHG emissions reduction potential, energy generation potential, and estimated cost and risk. And uh, we are taking this approach in order 
particular to facilitate those conversations with the community. Um, and of course, gauge how far, how fast collectively we want to move as a community towards uh, achieving the plan's goals. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, timing, the evaluation process will take, in, take place in advance of engaging with council and then the public on the options. So once complete, the short list of options will generate the two systems, so that moderate and aggressive, and will be brought forward for engagement. And this winter, um, once all engagement on the shortlisted options and proposed systems is complete, um, we'll be um, considering all of that feedback um, and working with our counselor sponsors group to also seek further guidance as we continue to develop the draft plan. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to end today's presentation with a look forward in terms of what's to come in our waste planning process. Um, so, of course, with Council's approval of the Waste Plan's vision, guiding principles and goals, and receipt of this technical information, um, staff will then begin evaluating the options. We'll be working uh, with the community this fall and engage um, with residents and key stakeholders to seek their input on the options that we should choose um, and that we should consider implementing as part of the draft strategy. And, of course, that feedback received through the engagement will support and help guide the development of the draft plan and short-term implementation plan that will be tabled for council consideration in early Q2 of next year. We'll then head back out to the community to seek their input on the final draft plan before tabling the final plan for council consideration early into the next term of council, so Q1 of 2023. Next slide, please. So that concludes today's presentation, and I'll hand things back to the chair. Great. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you, uh, Shelley. So we do have uh, three, at this point, three delegations to speak today. I believe they have. Yes, circulated. that's correct, Chair. Uh, and if I may, we have a technical motion on this item as well to uh, amend table 10 of the report. I know I was, I was going to get to that, Chris. It's like you just keep cutting me off. My apologies. Would just, would you just let me chair the meeting? Um, right. So we have a technical amendment completely stole my thunder. I was like building up to it. I wanted to really nail that one. And it just, ah, I feel so undercut. Uh, Councillor Menard, could you please move the, it's just a, it's just a small thing to make a minor, um, adjustment to the report. Yes, absolutely, uh, Chair. Um, whereas document three of the solid waste master plan phase two report uh, sets out the high level long list of options identified to meet the city's future waste management needs and their corresponding descriptions. And whereas these options are also listed in table 10 long list of options under section one of the main staff report. And whereas public works and environmental services staff uh, have identified that one of the options described in document three was inadvertently omitted from the list set out in table 10. Therefore, be it resolved that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management approve one, an amendment to the text of table 10 to include behavioral change management strategy under options in section one, promotion and education subsection 1A, outreach initiatives, and two, the substitution of the revised table 10 be included in the report when it is submitted to City Council. Uh, thank you. Let the the implications of that technical amendment uh, simmer and sink in before we actually vote on it later on. Um, so right now, before we get to uh, any questions from committee members, we will go straight to the delegations. The first delegation, I believe, um, circulated some information prior to today's meeting. It is Landera. Um, so speaking on behalf of Landera is Johannes Zebarth. And also here is Alana Bird, Spencer Warren, Graham Bird, and Vince Harkins. So just uh, full disclosure, this is the company that I met with uh, back in the fall of 2019 to discuss their technology and what, they, what they'd like to uh, propose um, here in the city of Ottawa. So go ahead, I don't know who's going to start. And we'll I, I'm going to start. Oh, perfect. Uh, good morning, Chair Moffat and committee members. Uh, if we could start the slide. 
Thank you for having us today. My name is Johanna Seabart and I'll be presenting with Alana Bird. And together with my team, we are here to introduce Landera, a new waste to energy system that will dramatically change how the world handles waste. Next slide, please. If you were to compare us to traditional technologies like landfilling and incineration, our system greatly reduces the overall footprint of waste environmentally, physically, and financially. The technology would be particularly a big win for Ottawa. We can divert waste from landfills to substantially extend their useful life. We create clean power to reduce environmental emissions and to meet climate targets. Our business requ model requires no upfront capital investment from the city. And we are a Canadian owned company headquartered in Ottawa where many of us were born and raised and we plan on being a big job creator here. The following slides will tell a bit about our technology and our goals for potentially working with the city. Next slide, please. Our story, Landera's technology started development in 2009 and was created to make large batches of activated carbon, which is used, for example, in air and water filtration. And it wasn't until 2016 that someone asked what would happen if we used our system to process municipal solid waste. After a few successful tests, we realized pretty quickly we had something extremely special. And we've since then invested our resources to perfecting our waste to energy system. Next slide, please. So how does it work? Step one, waste deemed unfit for diversion programs such as recycling and organics would be delivered to our facility. Step two, the waste would be baled to eliminate odors and leaching and these bales become our fuel cells. Step three, the bales are placed into a large canister. In step four, the bales, the canister is lowered into an autoclave, a technology used in several industries such as healthcare and fiber manufacturing. And at this point, we use a combination of heat, pressure, steam, and a small amount of air circulation in the system to break the waste down to its elemental form. In step five, at the end of the process, the waste volume has reduced by up to 95%, and we have three remaining and useful byproducts. Ash carbon used for landfill cover or in concrete aggregates, synthetic gas used for powering the grid, and sterilized recyclables. Next slide, please. So how are we different? I'll turn it over to Alana. Thanks, Johannes. So first off, we have extremely clean emissions and therefore can help the city in achieving its carbon reduction goals. Landera can actually reduce the emissions created by up to 99%. Next slide, please. But as you know, the climate change conversation is shifting to focus on both carbon reduction and carbon offsets. And we know that for each ton of greenhouse gas avoided by using Landera, the result is one carbon credit. This means that for every 200 tons of waste processed, or say about 20 garbage trucks or so, there will be over 11,000 carbon credits from diverting waste from the landfill and another 45,000 carbon credits for electrical power production. We also produce negligible toxic emissions. Because the waste isn't actually combusted in our system, we do not create any of the truly worrisome emissions, such as dioxins and furans, which in contrast with other thermal treatment technologies would need to be filtered out and heavily monitored. Next slide, please. We own and operate our facilities, meaning there is no upfront capital investment required by the city. We would like to negotiate an agreement to process a guaranteed amount of waste for a set tipping fee that will be in line with kind of current Canadian standards. This project would start with a pilot phase and expand from there. Next slide, please. We create clean power that would be used to power our facilities and the remainder can be sold to the grid. However, power sales are not always mandatory for our business model. Next slide, please. We reduce waste volume by up to 95%. So if you were to use Landera on all trail road waste, we could extend the useful life of the landfill by approximately 150 years. We're also able to do landfill reclamation, which would push this data out even further. Next slide, please. We process difficult waste streams without any pre-processing, which is a huge differentiator for us compared to other technologies that require drying, shredding, sorting, etc. Next slide. One please. minute remaining. And the construction of our facility is simple and scalable, so we can meet future growth needs. The building looks similar to an industrial warehouse with no visible stack emissions, and it's about the size of a Costco. Next slide, please. So to sum up, Landero would be a big win for the city. We fit well within the city's waste management goals and the five R hierarchy by processing residual wastes that are left after diversion programs. We will divert waste from the trail road landfill. We reduce waste emissions overall to help with climate change targets. And we'll do all of this with no upfront capital investment requirement for the city. Next slide, please. 
So we would just want to sincerely thank you for your time and for considering our technology today that we know could have a big impact on Ottawa's waste problem and the world's emissions problem. So thank you and we welcome any questions. Great, thank you so much, Lana. Thank you, Johannes. Appreciate uh, you coming today. I, I think, you know, in the past we've had, you know, as chair, ever since I became chair, I had many different groups reach out and whatnot, and you've taken the time to come here today and, and present to committee um, what you're offering, so I appreciate that. Uh, questions from committee, we have Councillor Keith Eglai. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation. Um, just one question of clarification. Um, your, your presentation references on a couple of occasions up to 95% uh, less waste. It, and, and I don't mean this in any kind of disrespectful way, but I think of, you know, when you go into a store and they say, you know, discounts up to 60% and there's one item on the shelf that's at 60% and everything else is at 20%. So um, I, I think I'd be more interested in not knowing what your upper limit is, but, but what I guess what your average is on a, on a typical, you know, um, uh, a typical, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, deliverable of garbage, I guess. So if you've got X tons uh, of garbage, what, what's, what's the average we can expect? 75%, 80%, what, you know, what it, so not the maximum, but what we could expect on a, on a regular basis if we were to provide um, the waste to your facility. So we're, we're experiencing um, between 90 to 95% reduction. Um, it, 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 all, it all ends up being dependent on how many inert things end up in, in, the, in the waste system because we, we can't process anything that is inert. So if someone throws in bricks and stones and those types of things or a drywall, um, so if it's inert, it can't be processed. If, it, if it's not inert, it does get processed and reduced. So, and then we also, we, we then also managed to catch whatever was recyclable that is inert. So, you know, glass and glass and steel, um, which still make up a large part of our, our garbage, even with our diversion programs, uh, we end up with those as sterilized byproducts that we can send back into the recycling system. But everything else that, it, the, anything else that is hydrocarbon based does get, um, does get uh, eliminated. And just one quick follow-up. You, you, you say you're Ottawa-based and you already have a facility. Um, so I guess two, two quick questions from that. Where's the facility located now? And if you did enter into even a, a pilot project with the city, um, would, you, would you need to uh, scale up your operations? Uh, and, and would that mean extending what you already have on, on that location? Or would it mean setting up a second location somewhere else in the city? Yeah, so, so the facility is actually located down in the States, just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it was a technology that I discovered back in 2018 when I went down for a demonstration at the, at the R&D facility and then ended up um, purchasing the company and making it a Canadian company. So our R&D work is being done in, in Tennessee where the plant is, uh, is a permanent facility with the, with the state authorities. And so as far as the, the second part of the answer, which is, you know, how would we scale up? Well, we would be talking about doing a very site specific pilot project. Um, you know, our, our thoughts were that we could actually do the pilot project in a fairly um, decent timeframe if we were, if city council would be able to uh, consider allowing us to use the old storage facility that was uh, across the road from Trail Road Landfill. So we would be able to do a pilot in, in a very short period of time in around 10 months a fit up inside of that old storage facility across from Trail Road and conduct the pilot out of there before heading into you know, a, a larger concept of a, a larger plant. A, a pilot would be around 75 tons per day uh, facility. And if, if I could add to that quickly. Um, so essentially our technology is autoclave based. So in order to expand our operations, we really are just adding autoclaves instead of actually having to expand the system size. Yeah, so we, it's the autoclave is a set size, and it can it can process approximately twelve tons per day, and that's the system that we've perfected. And so to 
we, we're also quite scalable. So we can actually, we just add the number of autoclaves based on the tonnage that's required or the tonnage in an agreement. You know, our thoughts were with the city that we would do a pilot project, which is like I said, about a 75 ton per day facility go through the pilot project and the environmental regulation side of things. And then the second phase would be to discuss something around a 400 ton per day plant. And all of those, all of those steps are scalable. So everything we do in the pilot phase can be used in the, in the larger scale plant. And then as the city grows or wants to consider larger um, tonnages, we can actually just continue to add autoclaves onto into the facility rather than you know we're not building a massive autoclave that then could potentially have problems we perfected it on a certain size and then from there we just add autoclaves and, and it makes it quite scalable so so just quick follow-up so nowhere in your model or your proposal are you suggesting though that that we truck our garbage down to chattanooga no no, 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 this would, no, no, not at all. <laughs> no, no, this, this, this would be that done. That in a whole other environmental issue. Of yeah, that. I, no, ab absolutely not. This would be done in Ottawa. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for You're the welcome. presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks. And just to give some, some perspective of that, um, Johannes, I believe, said they can process 75 tons. We actually take in about 2,000 tons of waste a day at Trail Road. Um, so we take in a considerable amount of waste and the challenge will always be, can we find someone that can actually process that volume? Um, and that's, that'll always be the tough thing. So even if, even if let's say we explored an opportunity like this with this company or any other, uh, we'd only be talking about a portion of our waste, uh, which is one of the reasons why in the report and in the, the waste residual management strategy, you'll see, we're talking about multiple technologies, um, offering the site potentially to multiple groups to come forward and actually process waste rather than the, the sort of all eggs in one basket approach that we took about 15 years ago. Um, thank you, Councillor Aguilar. Councillor Meehan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, interesting concept. Um, can you just explain what an autoclave is and um, how big an autoclave can get if you were to gear up? I mean, after. Sure. So an autoclave is a, is a pressurized steel vessel. And so the autoclave was invented about a hundred years ago, but we just took it to a, a new level as far as what we can do with it. So an autoclave is a steel, is a steel pressurized vessel. Our autoclaves are around um, 14, 15 feet high and about seven feet wide. And um, if, you, if you remember back to our slide presentation, there was a picture of, of an autoclave in one of those slides. And so um, we, we are, you know, so an auto, that's the maximum size we've deemed that we would want an autoclave to get. So we, we deem from research and technology and, and all the things we did in, in testing that, that uh, going beyond that size would become um, challenging to maintain our environmental standards that we were shooting for because right now we, we have very, very low emissions. And so, so the autoclave, is that's about the size of the autoclave. You can put a, approximately three tons of garbage into, into each autoclave once the garbage is bailed. And then that processing time takes between four to five hours to process the, the garbage in the autoclave. Now, the way the autoclave works, I'll just take a minute to explain it, is that um, it's very fascinating about how our system works. We have very, very low input values to get our process started. So the, the garbage is lowered and in, in put inside the cylinder in the bales. It's lowered into the autoclave. The vessel's closed and sealed and it becomes airtight. And then we, we use about five to 15 minutes of an outside fuel in source, such as like natural gas, to ignite a, a very small layer of charcoal barbecue in the bottom of this autoclave. So we get that, bar we get that charcoal glowing. And then that, and then we turn off the outside fuel source, and then the temperature starts to rise inside of the autoclave, similar to a pressure cooker or the way you would have your barbecue start. And then that heat rises and starts the de the thermal decomposition um, process, and we we add pressure into the vessel, and the and we also continuously reduce the level of oxygen is why we also have such clean emissions and why we don't produce furans and dioxins and the problems that other thermal technologies have. And we're doing it in a closed batch environment. We're the only 
closed batch municipal solid waste processing system out there for thermal conversion. Everyone else is trying to do it in a continuous flow methodology and they're, they're continuously having problems with oxygen causing the dioxins and the furans and the emission levels and fly ash and all of those other things that go with other thermal decomposition technologies. So we, we keep this in a very strict environment while we process the garbage and the, the temperature inside the vessel rises to about 600 degrees, 700 degrees Celsius. The outside of the vessel never reaches above 100 degrees Celsius. So it, it's really quite fascinating what's happening. And at the end of all that, when you open it up, you're left with your carbon, your ash and your residual inert items such as you know glass and steel and, and rocks, <laughs> if there were any. We would continue to recycle our compostables and our um, tins and glass and stuff like that, but everything else would go to the, um, the autoclave. That's correct. That's correct. You know, so so whatever whatever ambitions a uh, society has for their diversion programs and their recycling programs can all stay in effect, and we can deal with the residual from that. Okay, so for the the things that you call the inert um, elements that wouldn't uh, that might uh, deep decrease the efficiency of, of the process, we could actually put another step in there to, to take some of the, the cons some of those materials that should be diverted and then everything else would go to the enclave. So well, I, whatever, yeah, exactly. Whatever, whatever the city um, proposes that is still going to landfill would, would end up coming to us, right? So okay. absolutely, whatever you can take out that's reusable and recyclable, I mean, that's the goal, you know, and then we, we can handle everything else. So do, how do you envision, how many enclaves around Ottawa to handle what we now are sending to Trail Road? Well, so so for, for 2,000 tons, that's a big objective. Um, and, and the interesting part too, is that because our, our plants are easy to construct and because they're, they're so clean, you know, the, the city can also contemplate um, multiple locations eventually for, for a plant. But for now, we were talking about putting a, a plant in at, at Trail Road of 400 tons is what we would like to discuss, which would be 40 autoclaves approximately. And so, so in that, that size of a plant would be, you know, if you wanted to talk about a comparison in size, it, it would look similar to, you know, the size of a Costco. And then, but then from there, you can, you can continue to increase the scale of that plant by adding additional autoclaves and, and adding on to the plant. And of course, the, the scaling of that plant wouldn't be as, uh, wouldn't need as many square feet as you just add autoclaves because you have the front end working of the plant. So to do, to do um, 2,000 tons a day, which is at Trail Road, uh, would be 80, 160, you know, 200, 200 plus autoclaves, right? And you said no upfront cost to the city. Where does the cost come in? Yeah, so we, we would like to negotiate, a, um, you know, we'd like to get into discussions with you to talk about the pilot project and then the secondary, the second phase, which would be a 400 ton plant. And we would be able to do that with, um, with a tipping fee arrangement and a guaranteed tonnage based on the city's appetite for, um, for the size of the secondary plant. There are, there are economies of scale that we need to keep in mind, which is around 400 tons. So a 75 ton um, plant does, isn't, isn't economically viable as the pilot, but then the 400 ton plant would be economically viable. Is this uh, currently in operation in any, in any city? No, uh, currently it's not. We were just we, we've just come out of the R and D phase um, about a year a year and a half ago, and then we've also been enduring COVID like everyone else. So, you know, the business development cycle was uh, underway about a year and a half ago, but definitely slowed. But we are in discussions with uh, multiple municipalities in in different parts of the world right now. And the recent development. Oh, sorry. What was that, Elena? I was just going to say that the research and development plant does have a small contract with the local municipality down in Tennessee. Uh, so we can process about two tons of garbage a day there. And are there study papers that we can look at? Yes, we, we do have, uh, we do have papers. Um, in, in last fall, we uh, underwent third party testing to evaluate our cleanliness. And, um, you know, we, we achieved 95% uh, under permit values in Tennessee and the permit values of the uh, Ministry of the Environment of Tennessee are quite similar to Ontario and we can make those available to you as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Meehan. Uh, Councillor Hubley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for this presentation today. It's an interesting technology to look at. 
Uh, one of the things you mentioned in your presentation was that the technology can handle landfill reclamation. I find that quite interesting, and I'd like to hear a little more about that. Sure. So, um, you know, just from my, you know, my time at the Trail Road Landfill to examine the, you know, the state of affairs on how we're handling waste, um, you know, the, the newer part of the landfill has been dealt with. Uh, we've been using auto shredder residue as cover. And, uh, and it's pretty, you know, pretty modern waste, so to speak. Um, so the, the, the autoclave doesn't care what you put in it. Um, basically, like I said, it can, it can process the garbage on a snow day. The, the garbage can come in full of snow. The, the garbage can have, you know, bricks and rocks in it. Inert things will not get processed. So when you go to do landfill reclamation, um, it's simply a matter of, you know, choosing a specific spot in the landfill that we would want to, um, you know, have, evacuate the existing uh, old garbage. And you would simply just start bailing the garbage coming out of the landfill, regardless of what's in it. And that would immediately trap and stop any further leaching. It would stop the odors as you're digging it up, because I'm sure that's not going to be a pretty affair. And, uh, and then you create your fuel cells for processing. So it, it's simply a matter of digging it up bailing it and putting it in. And, you know, in, in sections of the landfill where maybe there was a time when soil, soil was used as coverage, um, the soil can go into the autoclave as well. It'll just come out as sterilized soil. So it'll be soil that can then be used again for something else. And, uh, and you just simply dig it up, bale it, put it into the autoclave. So we would not only, uh, if we did do a pilot or, or deployed this um, technology, we would not only extend the life of uh, Trail Road by putting less into it, but we could actually buy back some years uh, by taking things out of uh, um, Trail Road and processing is what you're saying, correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if you actually, if you actually think about the technology as well, you know, my, my, my goal whenever I'm presenting is when we talk about landfill reclamation is always to deal with the current issue first, you know, to stop mm -hmm. the flow and deal with that first and then, and then start addressing uh, landfill reclamation as a secondary process, because we would definitely, um, you know, there would definitely be a lot of discussion and, and planning and procedures to go and figure out how to start digging up the landfill from a policy perspective of, you know, health and safety and all of that. Um, but the, the, the main thing, if you stop and realize what I said about 95% reduction, so that's a 95% reduction in, in volume. What, what's left in the autoclave after that is carbon and ash, which can go to um, another use. And then there's the inert objects, which really had no business going into a landfill to start off with. So although we reduced volume by 95%, I think on a large scale and um, with, some, with some time on a, on a commercial site such as Trail Road, I think we'll quickly discover that we're, we're diverting, we're successfully diverting 95% or actually greater because we've actually successfully eliminated all of the municipal solid waste. We, you know, we've reduced it down to inert objects and carbon and ash that can have a use simply just by going to a concrete plant and being put into concrete, right? So I, I think it's, I think the success of obtaining the, the extra years on trail road, even before landfill um, could be quite high. Okay, and um, you mentioned uh, that if the city wants to go ahead with a pilot, you could be ready uh, approximately 10 months, uh, give or take. Uh, to do a pilot of 75 ton, correct? Correct. But if, if we decide through that pilot that we want to ramp up to a higher tonnage, how long does that take? So, um, you know, my background is construction. It's a very simple construction project. Um, it's as simple as building something similar that you see with one of the big box stores. So it's a light industrial building. Um, the longest lead items are, are, are about six months, which is primarily the autoclave and the power generation side of things. They both have about a six month lead. So between the engineering and design and opening the plant, engineering design would probably be about six months. And then the construction phase would be an additional 18 months. Then some of that could overlap. So it would be probably somewhere between a you know, 21 to 23 month, 24 month round trip to be open and in production. Okay, so... Okay, so two two years or two and a half years uh, from whenever uh, the pilot is deemed successful enough to scale up. Well, I would say two years from when the pilot is deemed successful. 
Yeah, but here at the city, we like to have contingencies. So let's say <laughs> okay. Four and a half, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, sir. Um, now, the other, uh, what would you be looking for from the city? Because you said, uh, as you answered Councillor Meehan, you're not looking for any capital costs up front. What exactly would the city be looking at to enter into a pilot? Uh, because um, what I'm looking for is what do you need from us to, to get into the pilot? But I want to uh, highlight what the chair said earlier about we're probably going to want to experiment with different technologies uh, around our waste flow and then make a decision based on that uh, multiple pilot idea. So what would you be looking for from us to enter into this uh, pilot? So so the, the first there would be, you know, what I discussed, the potential of using the old storage building for the pilot, which would be helpful and, and speed things along. Um, so there would be the pilot phase uh, of 75 tons, which would, which would take us through our environmental regulations. And then the second part of that would be um, a commitment for uh, a 400 ton per day agreement for a, for a facility. So based on the success, of course, of the pilot, right? So uh, it, it would be, it, you know, it would be in one agreement where there's the pilot phase and then on the success uh, of, the, of the pilot, then that would automatically launch us into the, the larger plant phase. So inside of that agreement would be, um, you know, the, the guaranteed tonnage of 400 tons per day. Um, ideally, it's, it's best suited to locate um, the plant where your garbage already goes um, due to all the permitting requirements. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, that would be based on a, on a guaranteed tonnage and a guaranteed tipping fee that we would discuss. Okay, uh, I, uh, Chair, I'm gonna look for staff to provide some comment on that after. I've got one last question for you and it's probably on the minds of many taxpayers in the city. Uh, what's the difference be between what you're doing and Plasco, the okay. technology that was deployed by Plasco? So just so everybody knows, uh, you know, I'm also uh, a businessman here in the city. And so I was a, a uh, Plasco was my client for their entire lifespan. I was the electrical contractor um, for their entire lifespan over on Trail Road. So I got to know the Plasco story quite well. Uh, and so where we differ, um, and it's quite interesting because when this technology first came up, I didn't even want to look at it because I'd been involved with Plasco. <laughs> and so, uh, so when I went down to Tennessee, the, the big difference is that, um, uh, Plasco was a, a, an open, uh, a continuous flow gasification process with um, using, attempting to use very, very high uh, energy inputs and very high temperatures to eradicate the waste. And um, the, the big difference for us is that we aren't attempting the, the um, continuous flow. We have a very, very scientifically controlled environment that we thermally convert the garbage in inside of the autoclave. And, and the, the main goal, the main thing that we've done there is that we've actually kept it to moderate temperatures to do the thermal conversion, just the right temperature to decompose molecularly the, um, the components in the garbage. And we also, we also keep it at an almost zero oxygen level inside of the autoclave. And those two things combined are, the, are sort of the secret sauce about why we have such low emissions and why we're so environmentally friendly. Because in that controlled environment, we, we truly create the, the decomposition process under that heat and pressure. Um, with Plasco um, and with pretty much all incineration or other or and technologies similar to Plasco that are still being experimented with, this continuous flow process still allows. It requires way too much heat, and it and and there's way too much oxygen getting at that heat at that at that conversion step. And so they're still dealing with um, a high level of residual. They're still dealing with creating dioxins and furans. They're still they're still stuck with creating fly ash, and all of the things that had that that plague them to get there. They also one of the really big differentiators is that um, we can take the garbage right from the truck. So the the, the garbage truck shows up, mm -hmm. and and we put it straight into our baler and wrap it. It, it like I said, it doesn't matter if it was a snow day, a rainy day, a, a dry day. You know, so, so we don't have to put it through shredders and dryers and do a whole bunch of pre-processing to make that work. That was also, that's also something that, uh, that has plagued technology similar to Plasco's where they just, they, they had to get everything to a certain level 
before they could treat it. So, and the, the benefit of that, yes, there will be the odd Chesterfield that shows up in the garbage truck or a mattress, but we'll just do those in bulk because we can fit anything that's about, you know, 10 and a half feet long into our autoclave that's seven feet wide. So we will just, we will just have bulk days. So we'll just pull the bulk items out off to the side and keep bailing. And then we can, we can deal with the, we can deal with the bulk items, you know, sort of towards the end of the day or have a bulk day where we catch up on bulk items. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I uh, appreciate you, the counselor. presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, hopefully we divert the bulky items. Well, that, that's what we hope for, right? But they do make it in there. Yeah. Yeah, we've obviously, in the lead up to this, I know myself and staff have also met with, um, you know, individuals, groups that want to take on furniture. They, wanna, they, they want the opportunity to take this stuff in Ottawa. Um, so it's, it's been a fascinating discussion, this entire master plan and all the different things that go into it. Uh, our next, uh, speaker, next, uh, counselor is counselor Sean Menard. Thanks very much, uh, Chair Moffat. Uh, thank you for being here in presentation. I just, uh, I want to throw some challenge statements your way and see how you respond to them, uh, based on typical kind of criticisms of these, these projects. Um, so be interested to hear how, how you respond to them. So the first is around financial problems that waste to energy, uh, typically about twice as expensive as, uh, landfilling and that incinerators or waste to energy, uh, facilities are expensive to build and operate and that contracts between companies and cities typically include a provision requiring cities to supply a minimum amount of garbage or pay a penalty. Um, and that it can lock cities into more business as usual waste generation. So I'm interested to hear how you respond to that. So I'll deal with the first one where you're correct, um, which is the, the, the guaranteed amount of tonnage. So that, that, that does have to happen because we do have a business model to, to satisfy, to be able to do a no capital cost for a municipality. And so, so there would have to be a guaranteed amount of tonnage um, delivered to the to the plant, or you know, sent to the plant to satisfy an agreement. Um, regarding um, the cost, um, so as Alana said in our in our um, presentation, you know, our, our costs are the basically around the same current Canadian standards of tipping fees, and then of course indexed over time, you know, the like along the coal lines of, of indexation. Um, but we, we aren't we aren't nearly the cost of an incinerator. So so in, in general terms, we're we're below well below the 50% cost to us for compared to incineration. So the, there our goal is that there won't be these hidden agendas of of um, getting a city shoehorned into a spot where they they regret working with us because um, our, our capital costs as well are much less than incineration and much less than some other um, some other thermal um, treatment plants of gasification similar to the Plasco. So our capital costs are just way less. Let me just say that way less than incineration. And uh, so that's how we're able to do an economically viable um, offering to a municipality like the city of Ottawa. Level, so, so, okay. Okay. Thanks for the answer. Uh, yeah. The a few other. Oh, sorry. Yes. Did I answer all those questions? I. I, I, I uh, well, there's only there was only two in there. I've got I've got some other ones that I'll. Okay. Ask you. I just want to add for the guaranteed amount of waste per day. I think with all the discussions that have happened so far, you know, we're we're not looking. You're on mute. You on mute, Alana? You got muted. Sorry, I think. So. Okay. Um, so with all the discussions to date, we're not looking to take on all waste going to trail road landfill at this current time. So I think there would be kind of a substantial wiggle room in order to kind of guarantee that that waste. And then we've kind of reviewed the waste management plan looking out from here to 2050. Um, and with kind of the city population growing and requirements growing, even with extremely successful diversion programs, there still will be those residual wastes as we know. Yeah, and one other thing, just about back to our capital costs, um, Councilor Menard, um, with our model, um, yes, we have the ability to produce electricity, um, but, and, and we will want to do that, but um, our capital costs are substantially lower than incineration that we actually don't need the, the power production portion to make it economically viable. 
So in, in some areas that you just won't be able to connect to the grid or the or the, the the repurchase agreements that you can negotiate with, let's say the province are so low that from a capital standpoint, it might not be viable to put the power generation portion in besides just powering our own facility. But we actually don't need that in a lot of municipalities to make it economically viable. Okay, um, a few other uh, sort of challenge statements. Um, there's criticism around this type of technology that there's actually a, more of an incentivization of, of waste production um, it, because it, it disincentivizes um, investment in, in recycling innovation. And some of the studies will sh showing that people may be less likely uh, to recycle if they knew that some of the pieces they threw in the garbage go to a waste energy incinerator or uh, uh, the technology you're talking about. And that it's um, that it's inconsistent with a with a circular economy. Um, so, you know, a way to improve sustainability and, and ultimately eliminate waste by by constantly reusing and, and recycling resources, so that the the fuel that this type of technology would use, some of the the plastics and other things like that, in a normal um, circular economy that we're trying to strive for here uh, with better diversion would actually be needed. You need that fuel, that plastic, the, those things that would be burned that could potentially be reused. So um, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I, you know, I, I agree with you. I don't disagree with you that that could um, provide a disincentive. I think we have a, a fairly long road to go to achieve, you know, as we're, as I was watching the slide presentation on the upcoming, you know, master plan creation and the, and the moves forward into consultation with the, with uh, with our citizens in Ottawa, uh, it's still going to be a while, and we still have a we still have a, a fairly large problem today. And I think that problem, I th think under best efforts, we're like under really great best efforts, we have you know a, a twenty five to fifty year road to go to, you know, reduce really at source. That's I think the ultimate goal is to reducing at source and not ending up in our in our creating this need for this circular economy. So we have a long road to go, and we still have a problem today. So you know, I think it's going to be still um, a necessary um, part of, you know, the political spectrum to deal with that and, and make sure we don't use this technology to dis to create a disincentive for reduction. I mean, reduction, I think, is the biggest R that I always favor, you know, um, and we're still just going to have to, as a society, maintain those goals of, of those reductions to um, to bring that down so that, you know, the ideal thing is that we, we we end up having we end up finding technology let's say it's ours and we end up let's say we do end up managing um, the 2,000 tons a day that goes to trail road right now it would be nice if we can stop that from growing you know that volume from growing as the city grows and then it's okay if it starts to get reduced as we get into the you know 20 30 40 year marker right it, it, it is just part of the evolution of a of a society so you know I, I appreciate that answer thank you um I, I think just a last comment here chair before i end is is we we in ottawa need to try some other things we haven't tried thus far and that includes things like uh, the amount of organics we're sending to landfill now and, 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 you know, getting better in terms of our diversion, looking at other jurisdictions where they're up at 60% uh, diversion, uh, you know, clear, uh, clear bags for, for garbage, what have you, those things really haven't been tried here. And uh, some, some of them are fairly easy to implement uh, green bins in, in our buildings being mandatory, like they are in Toronto, things like that, that, to me, need to come. We need to see those things first as, as part of a strategy before we move down the road of of, um, of this type of, of technology. Though I know we're going to be exploring several different options uh, as we move forward. So I, I, you know, I do appreciate you being here and thank you for the, the answers. Thanks, Chair. Can I just add really quickly that you know, even if we do get to zero waste, there also is the existing landfills and the ability for us to do landfill reclamation. So you know, for potentially the contract could transfer over. From the guaranteed new waste to existing waste that we also have to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you. And, and just to be clear, our 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 plan, our master plan, is is abundantly clear on that. That we want, you know, that five R hierarchy about diversion and recycling uh, certainly comes before uh, processing the residual waste. The residual waste is at the bottom of that of that hierarchy. We want to make sure we do everything the 
the one I would say interesting thing is that when certain recyclables actually go through uh, this process, you can then send them to be recycled. Um, yeah. Cans. Yeah. They come in like steel can, you know, our vegetable cans and things, anything that someone's putting in there, they actually end up recyclable and, and have value then as, as real steel. Yeah. It's not a lost opportunity for some of them, but obviously we want to divert that stuff as much as possible. The more people don't put plastic bottles in their garbage bag, uh, the better we'll all be. I know Councillor McKinney has been, been passionate on reducing the amount of available plastic water bottles in the city of Ottawa. And we're starting to get some headway on that with our, our contract negotiations. So we'll move to uh, Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair. We, we've been recycling since 1987, organic collection for a decade, and we have a timeline identified on our landfill. Uh, I, I don't want us to be thinking about building another landfill in the city. So we can put a lot of effort into higher diversion rates, which as you've all said, is should be our goal. But the reality is there's a finite amount of time left on this landfill and we cannot be planning to build another landfill, full stop. Every time I speak in schools, I have a garbage component and kids look at me like I have three heads that we are still doing the same thing 200 years later where we're collecting garbage, we're driving to the outskirts of the city where there's a big hole, we're dumping it, we're putting soil on top and we're repeating that over and over and over again. So it's 2021 and I appreciate the presentation today and the technologies that exist. I've been open-minded to incineration, but the two main drawbacks from what I understand are air pollution and toxic byproduct which have been very difficult to say, yeah, this is a road we should go down and ignore the fact that, um, you know, air pollution and toxic byproduct are, are created. So I, I really appreciate your presentation today. Lots of questions have been asked that uh, save me some time. And I'll just ask you, who's your ideal client? There are tons of small municipalities across Ontario, which just I don't think would be good clients for you. They're too small, yet they produce waste. Some municipalities or regions have landfills that have maybe longer life cycles than ours than in the city of Ottawa. So they may not be interested to switch or, or even you know forced to switch over to this technology. But at the end of the day, who's who is your ideal client? Well, I mean, the, the ideal client, you know, basically, if you talk about our, it has to do with our economies of scale. There, there isn't a, there isn't much flexibility for municipalities these days to take on large capital projects when it comes to garbage, right? It, it, it's a very challenging thing to get, um, to get through. Like you said, we don't want to build another landfill at two or $300 million. Um, and incineration is out of, out of reach for a lot of municipalities. So our, our, sort of preferred size, our, our main client is municipalities that are reaching that 150 to $200,000 marker. That's where they have enough, um, that's where they have enough waste to be able to handle the business model where we provide the, the upfront capital and put in the plant. Um, on, on smaller municipalities, you know, they're gonna have to go for granting sources and things like that to be able to offset it, right? Um, so, so right now our main focus is on municipalities where, they, you know, it's better when they're nearing the end of their of their landfill, um, or they're or they're also down in the states. We have a few municipalities that are, you know, they they've seen hundred percent increases in their tipping fees over the last three years because landfills are getting scarce and the cost of of approvals and the process to get a new landfill is is going up, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, and then there's some areas where they just still have, you know, there's some spaces I've been to where they just have big wide open landfills with, you know, decades and decades and decades in front of them and they're just not interested yet except for public pressure to reduce recycle and eliminate landfilling is rising, right? So, you know, what I'm seeing, you know, we're not like, I'm not going to pretend we blanketed the world in our sales pitches, but, you know, in, in Canada, the United States, and in, in uh, a few countries in Europe, um, you know, it, it's, it's very receptive and the discussion and the dialogue uh, opens um, quite nicely after, after presentations and a lot of questions and answers. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of need for the technology, especially because, 
um, it's so clean. You know, there, there isn't anything else like what we've produced in, in, as far as um, municipal solid waste technology conversion. So it's it's uh, it's a big win for for the city on many fronts. They they can avoid future capital costs. Um, you start dealing with this residual garbage problem that's filling up the landfills and there's another there's another big bonus as well which we we just sort of skimmed over in the presentation but you know this technology is really quite a carbon credit um atm machine so you know there's one thing to cap a landfill and capture the methane and get rid of some of the, some of those issues but in this you you truly eliminate the the methane coming off of the landfill so the the methane's gone you capture those carbon credits and then for the fact of making electricity from the synthetic gas that comes off of the the processing, you know the the carbon credits are even higher. You know, so it, it's 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 about it's somewhere between you know fourteen to twenty percent of a municipality's carbon footprint is the is the is the garbage after we've created electricity from it. So that's the offset that that you know a city would be looking at as well. Excellent. Okay, I'll leave it. I have tons more questions, but in the interest of time, I'll. I'll park it there. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you, and Councillor Leeper. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and thanks for your local contributions over the years as well. I know uh, you're, you're a well-respected uh, business person in our community. So thank you for, uh, for that service. Thank you. I, I will be very blunt. This looks a lot like vaporware. Um, I, I don't see... Um, an actual product that is working today, uh, especially at scale. Uh, just Googling around, I, I took a look. There's a, a company also in Tennessee called Waste Away uh, that is also using an autoclave to energy-based system. Are you the same company? Have you licensed your technology from them? No, and we're, we're, we have a patented technology for using an autoclave to thermally convert um, to thermally convert. I actually haven't heard of Wasteway. So, I mean, there's always someone new popping into the marketplace and we'll, we'll go and check them out to see if there's any patent issues there. But as far as, far as scalability, um, Council Leaper, um, you know, so down in Tennessee, you, we, we do have a functioning plant. We actually have a plant that's, um, you know, permitted. It's permitted for commercial use as well. So we're actually in the spot where we, we can commercially process municipal solid waste. We still operate it as a research and development facility because we do have, you know, there, there is, there's every day we learn something new about how, how and what's happening inside of our autoclaves for processing municipal solid waste. And we also run, we also run test batches for clients down there who have challenging waste streams. So as an example, we are, we, we just finished, um, we just finished processing waste from a uh, particle board manufacturer. They make particle boards, laminates, all sorts of things. And they have very, very nasty waste streams and they have about 14 factories in the United States. So, so that we just finished processing things that no one could process in our autoclave. So as far as being able to, you know, see it working, it, you can see it working as far as scaling it. The real beauty of this is that we're not going to make an autoclave the size of Constitution Square. You know, we're not going to be taking an autoclave technology that we have um, perfected municipal solid waste inside of and then start making it the size of a downtown office building to take 400 tons a day. Our scalability really comes from we perfected a black box and now we're going to add multiple black boxes inside of a building. You know, rather than making one huge autoclave, we are just adding modules on to allow, uh, to allow for the tonnage required. So scalability isn't the same issue as you would have seen on a previous pilot that you went through. Um, scalability is achieved by what we're already doing, just adding more autoclaves into a facility. Okay, I get that. Uh, and your current yeah. facility, your your test bed facility, is 150 tons. No, our current our current research and development facility is actually quite small. It, it it's actually a two autoclave um, uh, little plant, and 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 we really just test waste there. We just drive this machine as hard as we can every single day. You know, the other day we're now experimenting with tires on their own. So the other day we processed 50 tires in a batch and the only thing left was the steel belts and a small pile of carbon and ash. You know, so, so we're constantly testing different waste streams and different, different avenues that people are bringing us that, and their, and their potential future clients that we're doing this, this work for, right? So, 
you know, like as I as I mentioned, the the particle board um, company is now engaged for a plant on their factory to deal with their waste streams because their waste streams are becoming more and more complex and more and more expensive to handle. Okay, um, and thank you very much for addressing the uh, the patent question. That's that when I take a look at you know the um, what looks to be a few different companies uh, who are competing in this space, I guess to become the leader, uh, patent issues uh, do make me nervous in terms of working with a partner. Um, so. Uh, how many municipalities in North America are you set to make agreements with? Would we be the first? So we do have a we we do have an MOU with the municipality where we're actually located. Um, in, just outside of Chattanooga, we're in a small municipality, probably very similar to Iron Prior. Um, and they, they, they sit surrounded by, you know, uh, five or six counties that also have, you know, uh, towns the same, same size of, of Armpar. And so th those, those counties are right now um, applying for grants. They do need grants to offset the, uh, the size of the plant because the tonnage is going to be under 200 tons a day um, for, those, for those counties. But they, we, we have signed an MOU with them to um to a lot and it was it was part and parcel both ways so we could all understand the process that we're in and as well they they also needed that um, documentation to be able to start applying for the the grants that they're going after so they 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 and they have started to have success so uh with the granting process and the discussions are now starting to open about time frames um it, in regards to, so that's the one municipality in the United States. We have a few other municipalities in the States, but they're earlier on, very similar to the stages that we're at with you. And then in Europe, we're a little bit further along where we're, we're into the, the next level, um, where the, the, a couple of the municipalities in the EU, they have a, a very large um, grant available for dealing with municipal solid waste. And so um, there's several municipalities that are now making their applications for the granting process to help them with, uh, with, with uh, the, you know, how they want to structure it over there. Their model over there is not to uh, have us own and operate. They'd prefer to own and operate and we'd be providing support. Okay. Um, and then finally, I, I think I've heard of a couple of other counselors ask uh, the question, but I, I, I don't think I've heard an answer. What would be your upfront capital investment uh, in order to get started if, uh, if Ottawa went down this path? You mean what would our, what would our upfront capital be? Yeah, for, how much would for, you have to, to, to build it, to build the facility? You mean how much would it cost us to build the, the pilot facility? Yeah. It, it would be under $10 million. Okay. Good. Yeah. That's a reasonable number. Yeah. Um, okay. It's very interesting stuff. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Brockington that we need to keep an open mind to a lot of different things. So uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Leeper. Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'd really like to thank uh, Landera for the uh, very informative uh, presentation about this uh, different type of uh, gasification uh, technology. Uh, we'd acknowledge it's, it's different than um, a typical incinerator technology and, and other gasification technologies, as you've noted, that uh, you're burning, um, I guess, at a lower uh, temperature than, than well, other. So uh, Councillor King, can I just, um, I got to step in on that one. So we yeah. actually never have combustion inside of our inside of our autoclave. So we actually don't burn the garbage. We do use an outside fuel source to get the charcoal started. And then that's the last time that a flame ever enters and it doesn't touch the municipal solid waste. It, it, it only touches the, the charcoal at the bottom. And after that, it's actually a rising heat temperature that thermally converts. So we actually don't, we, we don't, we don't picture a raging fire inside of the autoclave. Um, picture it more like the temperature in your pressure cooker rising. And if you left that poor pot roast in that pressure cooker would turn to ash yeah and i think yeah you you have uh, painted that that picture uh, for us so that's what i'm acknowledging that it is okay. uh, incineration as as anybody would think of this this is gasification and it's different uh, but um, we've been talking primarily about the greenhouse gas uh, emissions outputs uh, and obviously, uh, you're saying that we're we're going to see more efficiencies there if this type of technology is is adopted. I'm wondering about the inputs. 
uh, of the natural gas? Uh, what would be uh, the input in terms of the uh, usage um, of uh, nat gas usage uh, to, to really fuel uh, this type of system? Because of course, um, that also contributes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the city. Yeah. So, um, so there's there's two parts to that question. Um, the first part is it's it's about between two to three cubic feet of natural gas for every uh, twelve tons of of uh, municipal solid waste that's processed. So that's a very low amount. It's just enough to get that charcoal turning red. You know, um, d- downstream we produce an immense amount of uh, synthetic gas. So you know our goal is to examine the technologies. We, we can quite easily capture our own synthetic gas but we haven't done the R&D on, on capturing that, cooling it, and then and storing it. So, uh, you know, d- downstream of, of our initial first few plants, we're going to be experimenting with using our own synthetic gas and not needing um, new external um, outputs beyond the initial start plant, uh, the plant startup. As I mentioned with, as I mentioned with the water, um, did I mention the water issue yet, Alana? No, eh? So, so it, it's a really fascinating technology. So, in the beginning, you need to use out, outside um, inputs. One of them is natural gas to start the process. The other one that we need an outside input of is water for our processing. But once you've run the plant um, for a certain amount of time, which is quite a short amount of time, we actually will be self-sustaining after that. So we produce our own electricity, we produce our own gas, and we produce our own water. We just need out, outside inputs to get started. Now, on the natural gas side of things, we are not in in a spot uh, initially to be able to harness our own synthetic gas because there's uh, there's quite a cost to doing that R and D to figure that out. But people are doing it all over the place. It's just not something that we were spending our time on right now. But it's in it's in our future planning to harness our own synthetic gas and really need the outside inputs to start the plant, and then it's actually fully self-sustaining after that. We recapture our own water off of the waste and then reuse it for our processing. We use any water that comes off of garbage delivery. We, we, we will just be capturing it all and continuously reusing it inside of our plant for, uh, for its operations. Okay, thank you, Chair. I was just uh, curious about the, the inputs because obviously um, the, the inputs are can be as impactful as uh, the yeah. emissions and outputs. So uh, yeah. that, that was uh, an item that I didn't really hear addressed, but what you're really saying is that uh, the, tech, the um, inputs are used to really start uh, this cycle and then the cycle in a sense is self-sustaining. Absolutely self-sustaining. We, 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 use, we use between five to 15 minutes of outside fuel source to start the cycle. And after that, the entire processing inside of the autoclave is self-sustaining and we just continuously control it with airflow and oxygen deprivation and, uh, and water for quenching. And, so, and then municipal solid waste also um, gives off a lot, of, um, a lot of water as well and synthetic gas. Therefore, we're, we're gonna be self-sustaining. This is a huge differentiator for us because many other technologies require a constant fuel source, whereas Johannes mentioned, we really just need it for those first kind of five to 15 minutes. Thank you for that. Uh, obviously, if uh, any uh, pilot is proposed, I'd still be interested in seeing what uh, the totality would be in terms of the uh, needs for the, for the nat gas inputs. But thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. Chuck. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor King. Uh, Councillor DeRuz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A very good presentation and some of the questions have been answered, but I have a, a quick uh, couple of quick questions, John. You explained that you need uh, you need some time before this, the facility start producing its uh, its own so, uh, sources, like Councillor King was asking. What is that time frame? Like, what are we talking about? And how many thousand, uh, how many tons of uh, of uh, garbage you're looking for? Yeah, so, so for the plant to produce enough of its own resources to be self-sustaining would be, you know, I actually haven't done the math, but just based on the math I have in my head would be about approximately a week. After a week of operations, we'd end up with enough resources um, to, to be self-sustaining. Um, as far, and so as far as tonnage goes, you know, the, the ideal plant size is around 400 tons per day. So around 400 tons per day after the pilot process, right? So the, the, pilot, the pilot stage would be around a 75 ton per day facility. And that's what's required to go through a piloting process in Ontario. You actually don't need to have that many tons, but you do have to go through a piloting process with new technology. 
and then the the second part of the the second part of the project would then be a 400 ton plant which would then ha have to go through a full construction phase uh, thanks that lead me to my next question that uh, do we have any discussion or uh, uh, can we talk a little bit about the approval around this from the provincial body so there is any can you uh, can you shed some light on yeah. that one? Alana will answer that question. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So we've had preliminary discussions with the Ministry of Environment, and Conservation, and Parks, and really from our current understanding, both the proposed pilot facility and the commercial facility would be subject to two certificate of approvals. So one being the air and noise emissions, and the second being wa the waste approval, which is really for you know receiving, handling, storing of waste. Um, and then beyond that, the commercial facility would be subject to an environmental assessment, whereas the pilot facility would likely be exempt. And that's because we are building it to be within the limits of the, the pilot project that Johannes kind of referred to. So that's under 75 tons and less than three years of operations. And really the plan is to kind of operate the pilot facility for at least six months. And then we would use the data from that pilot facility to support an environmental assessment process with the commercial facility. And, and I mean, it's interesting because it's the same process we went through in Tennessee for our R&D facility. You know, we were given an R&D um, pilot uh, permit at first, and then we had to um, come back and start to validate that permit um, through the piloting process stage. And that's what led to our commercial permitting. Thank you. So there is, uh, I, we don't see any hurdle or any, uh, we could work with the Minister of Environment if we wanted to move forward with this pilot project and uh, we don't see any delay. And what is the time frame you're thinking? Like, what do you think that we need a time frame for us to start a pilot project? Well, I, I think that'll depend on all of us um, getting together to compile the agreement, right? And so, you know, after an agreement is completed, so post agreement, it would take us about 10 minutes, uh, about 10 months to open up the pilot facility. Thank you. I was happy with 10 minutes, but I didn't realize. Yeah, that. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. A great presentation. Looking forward to keep the conversation going. Thank you, Councillor. All right. Uh, thank you, Councillor DeRuz. I don't see any more questions. Um, so appreciate, I know, um, obviously this has sparked a lot of discussion and I appreciate um, the questions from every uh, member of the committee. And I think the, I think the presenter does as well. I think it's helpful to understand um, just the perspectives of various councillors. Obviously this is, you know, if we were talking about an actual incinerator, Durham style incinerator, I think we know where where many councillors stand. I think this is a bit of a different scenario. And I think from the councillors, the questions from Councillor Bernard, Councillor King, I think you see that there are certain perspectives that that we want to make sure we're covering off as a city because um, these things aren't, you know, necessarily slam dunk obvious decisions. They're things that take time and they take a lot of um, sort of thoughtful consideration. So when it comes time for staff, I know that Will McDonald is here as well. Uh, our procurement, our chief procurement officer, as well as staff from the landfill and from solid waste services, obviously. Uh, so thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Alana. Uh, appreciate your attendance here, Vince and Spencer. We didn't hear from you, but I appreciate uh, appreciate seeing you on the camera. <laughs> good, good to see you again, Scott. And thanks for your time. We appreciate the the opportunity to present. No worries. Thank you. Yes, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Chair Moffat, and thank you, councillors, for having us today. Really, really appreciate it. I get. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so we have our next speaker. He's no stranger to our committee. Uh, Waste Watch Ottawa, Duncan Burry. Duncan's still kicking around here. My apologies. No, okay, no, there I am. Apologize. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you, committee. Um, I'd like to start by reiterating uh, Waste Watch Ottawa's uh, long-standing support for the preparation of the Solid Waste Management Plan, and we're really pleased that we're at this important point of identifying a framework for evaluating uh, the process uh, and long list of options. Um, and I'm also, just to reiterate, we're really pleased to be on the sounding, uh, stakeholder sounding board. So firstly, um, we wholeheartedly endorse the Zero Waste uh, Ottawa vision 
and would certainly reference the hierarchy of highest and best use outlined by Zero Waste Ottawa, which is a, a listing uh, of, of hierarchy, which is a little bit more comprehensive than the one listed in, in the report. Um, we also support the guiding principles and goals, although we do have specific concerns and questions, which I will discuss in a minute. The long list of options appears to be comprehensive and identifies opportunities and best practices that could be applied in Ottawa. We do have a one, one suggestion for an additional option, uh, mandatory waste diversion at all city facilities, which is option 2B2, is a really good idea, but addressing the city's own waste footprint could be further supported by the development of a zero waste green procurement policy that would encourage such things of the purchase of materials with recycled content. Um, there's no silver bullet or black box that's going to make waste going away. Reaching a zero waste future with aggressive waste reduction and enhanced waste diversion are going to require sustained effort and the implementation of a wide range of mutually supported policies, programs, and waste management systems. Trail road is a unique and valuable asset the city is very lucky to have. And I think as I've heard already from a number of councils, it's gonna be very, very difficult, expensive to, to replace. And we clearly need to strongly move to continue to put as much effort as possible into extending its life for as long as possible. Waste Watch Ottawa supports the goal of achieving 100% greenhouse gas emission reductions from the waste management system. That said, we still haven't seen the baseline greenhouse gas analysis of the current waste management system. This data will be critical to conducting a comparative assessment of the greenhouse gas impacts of the proposed options. This data has been often promised, but has yet to be released, and we'd like to know where it is. Waste Watch Ottawa agrees that environment, society, and the economy are interlinked, uh, but the triple bottom line evaluation framework that is being presented could be better explained we must be alert to how subjective the options assessment process could become unless we are very careful. To avoid such a concern, the five-tier color rankings, the overall category score, and the 6.66 point weighting calculation needs more explanation and transparency uh, and public participation to ensure broad buy-in. Um, we'd like to know a little bit more about how councillors and stakeholders will be participating in the evaluation process. So a little bit more clarity, which I imagine will be forthcoming, um, is, is needed on that. Where are the waste diversion targets? Committing to a zero waste future is commendable, but the vision needs to be backed up by firm and progressive targets and an appropriate measurement system to track progress. Let's remember that one of the reasons we are where we are today is because Ottawa's waste diversion numbers are languishing in the, in the low 40%, whereas leading municipalities are achieving over 65%. Despite the current uncertainties related to the transition of recycling programs, which staff note and produce responsibility and no clear provincial direction on organics, the waste plan must establish clear and measurable baseline diversion targets, which is in fact commonly done in all waste plans. There is a need for a regular annual reporting on the status of a city's waste management system. And this takes on even more importance as the waste plan implementation rolls out. The reporting should include an analysis of whether we are saving money by using in-house collection services rather than contracting out. As a transition to the new producer responsibility framework takes hold, a regular monitoring of in-house and contracted services needs to be undertaken. Future contracting options need to be considered. One minute in remaining. In conclusion, there are no quick fixes. And in this regard, I might just take a little moment to, to, to note about the Landera proposal. I would suggest you add it to the list of options for evaluation under the general heading of residuals waste management. Please don't compromise uh, the public engagement or the assessment process by appearing to favor one particular technology or approach before you've even decided on a residuals waste management <clears throat> policy. Um, we all know what happened with Plasco on a sole source and I would really caution you about leaping into the water before you know how deep it is. So thank you very much um, and for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Burry. I would say one thing about the Plasco, one of the biggest issues I think we had with that was exclusivity, um, putting ourselves into an agreement where there was only one option and not really being able to do anything until that option subsided, which eventually was uh, their bankruptcy that caused that. But we were, we were tied to them. And I think any future agreement the city gets into, they have to avoid exclusivity. 
because if something fails, we shouldn't be tied to it. We have to, we need to be able to move on. And I think if there's, you know, we've been approached to, they're not here today, but we've been approached to uh, myself. I know Councilor Shantiri had spoken to uh, this group as well, Sustain, which you've probably heard of. They're out of Halifax. They have a test facility, which I believe is either operational or soon to be in Chester, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, so that's another group that has been, you know, has approached us. I, we have other municipalities that approach us too, and they, they want to couple in with other with other technologies, but all they want from us is our waste. And I'm not as keen on that. So they want to, they want to open up a facility somewhere else. Let's say I'll give an example of the Pontiac region and they want our waste because they need the guaranteed waste stream. Uh, the last thing, if we're going to guarantee our waste stream, it's going to be within our boundaries. It's not going to be to give it to someone else outside of our boundaries. And then you get into the situation that Councilman and I were speaking about um, with having to tie our waste to, to some other contract. And all of a sudden now we're trying to create waste almost in, in some degree. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of cautionary tales uh, with Plasco and we have to make sure we learn from those before we enter into anything. So we'll obviously agree with you. And I think that the discussion today, I think it fits because obviously with the quasi off ramp of the residual uh, waste management strategy is certainly somewhere where we are looking at what we can do about that, that landfill long-term. So, Again, thank you for those comments and obviously your involvement on the stakeholders group as well, which I know you'll be um, continue to be involved in going forward with this plan. Uh, Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. And yeah, I also appreciate your uh, delegation here today from Waste Watch Ottawa. Uh, appreciate the, the endorsement of the, the Zero Waste Ottawa vision, uh, the guiding principles and the goals and um, the, the long list uh, that has been released. And I think you're absolutely right. We need to go through that process before anything else, um, you know, is, is signed to that sort of thing. Um, I, I did want to raise a couple of pieces that came out in your presentation. Um, you, you mentioned that, um, the, the city's own waste footprint could be further supported by the development of a zero waste green procurement policy. I'm wondering if you could expand on that. I think it's just a companion piece to the whole notion of, of uh, dealing with the city's uh, waste footprint, which is surprisingly large. I think, what, what was the number? Eight, nine percent of the waste we dispose of is generated from city facilities. So I think what the city needs to do is to support as best as it can, shifting to that circular economy that the plan talks about. And that means, in fact, providing markets for things like waste plastics. One of the issues with plastics have historically been markets have been a real challenge, and particularly since China legitimately close the border to all of our nasty plastic waste. So if you, in fact, build into your procurement policies requirements such as any packaged good or anything the city buys has a certain amount of recycled content, it's just one example, or meets certain greenhouse gas objectives, that you could support the bigger picture of the circular economy. Um, so it's just a companion piece to addressing the city's waste management facilities footprint. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I will be asking staff about the point you raised around our, our GHG data on the, uh, the baseline for the waste management system uh, in open session. So I'll ask that question of them. Thank you for raising that as well today. Um, you also ask a question around stakeholders and the general public um, participating and helping to assess and rank the <laughs> triple bottom line elements for each of the options. Um, how do you, how would you see, how would you see that working? Well, I think it has to be a fairly open process. I mean, particularly some of these issues, I mean, social impacts can be very value laden. Um, and I think we just need to be fairly open and transparent. That's really what we're arguing in this particular case. And, and it's encouraging to see that the city has got the amount of response it has, <clears throat> despite the challenges of the pandemic. And we just need to kind of make sure that we continue to be as open to that. <clears throat> and that when people are looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, looking at options, that they in fact have a fair understanding of what the balance of that is and, and have some opportunity to maybe even score them themselves. Um, we'll do that certainly on the sounding board, but I think we could do that with the public as well. Okay. And then you also, another important point I think you raised is around the regular annual reporting. So I'll, I'll also <coughs> add that in staff, uh, staff in open session, just to give them a, a heads up as well. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thank you, Council. Thanks so much, Ottawa. Thank you very much, Council Menard. 
I don't see any of the questions from members of committee. So thank you, uh, Mr. Burry. Appreciate, as always, your attendance here and your engagement. And we move on now to Kate Rieke, who has just turned her camera on. And she's here with Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability, CAFES. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair Moffitt and uh, councillors and city staff. Nice to see you all again after a long hiatus. Um, a few words about CAFES, whom I'm representing today. Uh, CAFES uh, is a network of residents, groups, and citizens associations in Ottawa. We were established in 2010, and, uh, and we want to support effective local environmental action on this unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, our membership is drawn from 43 different community associations and six citizens organizations, and so we really represent the whole gamut from uh, urban, suburban, and rural communities. So I'm pleased to say, uh, in general, CAFES is very pleased with the progress made to date. Uh, in the development of the vision, the guiding principles and the goals for the solid waste master plan, as well as with the adoption of the triple bottom line evaluation approach. We of course have been members of the stakeholder sounding board. Uh, and so we've been involved in this uh, from, from day one. We're happy to see uh, this new vision of a zero waste Ottawa adopted. And we understand that this is to be subject, uh, suggestive of the need to strive for a more circular economy, uh, you know, which, which really means that there is no waste, right? That, uh, that waste is not thought of as waste, but it's a resource that, uh, that value can be derived from. So CAFES uh, works closely with Waste Watch Ottawa and is fully supportive of all the points uh, that Duncan raised just now. Uh, including uh, the need for measurable diversion targets, GHG baseline data, and transparency in the evaluation methodology. In November, I think it was, CAFES and Waste Watch Ottawa, we listed um, some recommendations for the Solid Waste Master Plan. And we were pleased to see actually that many of these have been uh, included in the high level long list of options presented. Um, I did a little uh, check uh, of, of, of the long list. And I'd like to um, highlight, however, a few of our recommendations that appear not to have been taken on board, or at least duly emphasized in, in this long list. The first thing that we had recommended was a bylaw banning the commercial use and sale of all unnecessary single use plastic items that are not easily recyclable. And uh, of course, we know that bans of certain plastic items are being considered at other levels of government. Um, however, there's no guarantee as to the comprehensiveness or even the timeliness of these measures. And meanwhile, there's really, we've done our homework and there's really nothing to stop the City of Ottawa from demonstrating local leadership and implementing such a ban. The second thing uh, we recommended is uh, a no single use item procurement policy for all city facilities and programs. Now we see in the long list a reduction strategy that's proposed, but we believe that the city needs to be bolder in its leadership and eliminate the procurement of unnecessary single use items altogether, or even better, as Duncan has, has mentioned, a green procurement policy that goes beyond the single use issue. Another of our key proposals that we had made was to allocate significant resources to programs that seek to change consumption patterns and reduce waste through product reuse, repair and refurbishing. And on this point, we're really pleased, I have to say, to see such a wide range of options presented uh, relating to waste avoidance, reduction and reuse. And we really endorse this general thrust. But in terms of funding, it's really important that we allocate sufficient city funding for these options and not to be relying on, you know, the volunteer labor of, of charitable organizations. And we really want to see these institutionalized as permanent city programs. Savings, like the city stands to save uh, quite a bit um, in, term, in the implementation of the extended producer responsibility program. And I think that these um, savings could easily be directed towards some of these programs. One minute remaining. Okay, um, I think all of these uh, recommendations all support the reduction of waste being generated in Ottawa, but, it is, um, but, but even more importantly, we'd like Kate, to just, issue uh, a final- Just take your time. Yes? 
Just take yeah. your time. I know you get a bit, but just take your time. Okay. Um, but uh, more importantly, we'd like to issue a final cautionary note on uh, residual waste to energy technology, such as that uh, which was presented by Landera just, just earlier. Um, so cafes, for one, will be looking very carefully at the assessment of options for residual waste treatment from a life cycle GHG emission standpoint. Many of the proposed technologies from mass burn incineration to pyrolysis to gasification, like we, like we just heard, are energy intensive and can have substantial carbon footprints. Um, Although these can also produce energy, their offsetting potential is only partial and reduced over time as our existing energy grid becomes greener. All of this needs to be carefully quantified. And the last thing we want to do in the context of the climate emergency is to lock ourselves into technologies that actually increase our emissions profile. So in conclusion, we think in general, the city is generally on the right track in terms of shifting the focus from end of life waste management towards more circular approaches, focusing upstream and on waste reduction. And we hope that these points will be considered. And of course, we look forward to the next phase of engagement on the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as always, appreciate uh, CAFE's engagement at, at committee. Uh, so we have Councillor Menard here for you. Thanks very much um, for being here. Really nice to see you. I'm just wondering if you have any advice for us on that engagement as it comes. There's a lot planned. Uh, this is one of the things moving through council now and in the next term of council. Is there anything that you would really like to see as part of that engagement uh, process that you're not necessarily seeing in the plan now? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think one of the things is the general pu pu public is not really uh, very well versed in all of these new technologies for chemical uh, processing and uh, gasification. And really the average person doesn't understand these technologies well enough to have an informed decision. Uh, so I think it, it'll be really important to be able to synthesize the, the critical information uh, in a way that is generally understandable and um, and so that people know what they're voting on, what they're what they're what they're talking about, and what they understand. Another element that um, that I we didn't see highlighted in the report, but I think is really super important, is the issue of bioplastics. And uh, and although it's kind of there's a lot of really good public education uh, work that uh, that is being proposed as part of the um, uh, the long list of options, but I think bioplastics it merits some focused attention because it's it's a real nut to crack. We have to educate people on how uh, how to dispose properly of all the different types of bioplastics, and we also need to make sure that our um, composting or whatever kinds of organic waste uh, management uh, facilities can handle um, uh, bioplastics. They represent a huge opportunity, but with certain risks, and we need to uh, keep that engagement up. Those would be two that I would recommend. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Bernard. Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Kate and Cafes, for uh, being back at committee. Uh, your input is always uh, greatly appreciated, of course. Um, I just want to circle back around to um, um, your notion of, you know, changing consumption patterns and, and single-use plastics and, you know, what... Uh, what is within our purview as, as a city. And um, Chair Moffat mentioned at the beginning that you know, we've been working towards this. So we had a, a motion um, that we passed. I, I brought it actually about a year and a half ago that look, looking at uh, city facilities and, and you know, what's uh, the single use plastic that is, is uh, embedded in our, in our uh, city facilities. Um, and I think really the most, to me anyway, and I think to most people, um, the one that really is um, the most difficult to understand is plastic water bottles, right? And, and how we 
how we continue to ignore the fact that we've got the best drinking water in the world and we turn to plastic water bottles um, and uh, it, it turn to water that's, that's you know, um, delivered to us in, in these plastic bottles. And we know that most of those bottles end up in the waste stream. They don't go into, into recycling. Um, and do you see, um, and, and I have some, some questions to staff on this, um, cause I, um, but do you see any other way of changing that behavior and changing that type of consumption pattern um, without two things, uh, a ban, like almost an outright ban, like you just don't, just don't produce them and don't, and don't purchase them as a city. Um, and, um, you know, doing what we can to promote our own drinking water. And do you think as a, as a resident and as a member of, of cafes that, that we do enough as a city to promote, again, what is exceptionally good drinking water? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. The drinking, the, the, the plastic water bottle issue is another difficult nut to crack. And I was, uh, you know, dismayed to find that that still, um, even despite your motion uh, from last year, there's still, um, we're still working on finalizing those contracts. Um, seems to take an awful long time. Um, I think you're right that, that uh, it will involve a mixture of policy levers. I mean, Yes, one can outright ban things, and eventually that will lead to uh, to uh, behavioral change. Uh, we can study behavioral change because sometimes, and that's part of the the, the proposal. And I think that's really important: the behavioral insights um, as to what what causes people to to make fundamental lifestyle changes. Um, but I think there's also the promotional element that you mentioned that I don't actually think that the city does enough uh, um, outreach in that regard because, and I think it's partly structural. I think, I think the city is run in silos as many bureaucracies are. And so, so you know, what could be a, a, a very positive um, promotional message uh, there's some there seems to be no institutional home uh for who, who's going to be leading this uh this this uh, effort to to uh to um educate people on the quality of our water um uh there's there's many different um citizen initiatives that we can we can work with um uh and and in terms of lowering consumption rates, I think it's, um, the city does need to play a role and it can be, it can be um, highlighting good practices. Businesses that are, um, that are working towards um, circular ap approaches should be highlighted. Maybe, maybe a funding program uh, or some sort of, um, mm, highlighting good practices or looking at other municipalities that are doing it better than we are and what are they doing um so i think there's a lot that can be worked from uh we're not in this alone other uh, other jurisdictions are are working through these same issue uh learning from others uh, good experiences and um and uh, and working through a variety of policy levers, some of them regulatory, others uh, incentivization, uh, and um, and um, uh, eliciting and valorizing uh, local efforts. I think it's got to be a mix of everything. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, and uh, just appreciate your your insight into that. And I've had the discussions with staff, and certainly I don't think they disagree. But we have to we have to find what works and and move forward on just reducing it completely and changing those behaviors. So, thank you. I appreciate the uh, appreciate the uh, the response. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. I will just mention one thing. I know uh, Councillor McKenney had clarified this on on social media as well. The the contracting thing wasn't necessarily a uh, an issue of staff taking you know too much time. It's literally we had contracts up until a certain point, and the motion was always about 
um, negotiating those next contracts. But I think it was, there was still about um, 18 months or, or, or two years left in those contracts at that time. Is that right? It was, it was actually a volume. volume. We volume, had to, right. we, we had to get through a certain volume. Uh, which was unfortunate, but COVID, of course, and shutting down our facilities meant that the volume was not moving. Um, so, uh, you know, I, staff have gone back and, and there are further negotiations. And I, my understanding, um, actually working uh, with uh, Councilor Menard and staff, is that they are, um, you know, coming up, coming to an agreement that we will uh, not have plastic bottles in, in city facilities. So, so some good news, certainly, but that, and I think that that's as a result, because I don't think Pepsi and Coke do things, I mean, I've never worked for them, but I think they do what they do for profit. Um, and I think change of behavior is what drives that, right? I think people are just demanding something different. So, so we have to just take advantage of that and make sure that our water is just, um, promoted and there's plenty of refilling stations yes exactly and bathrooms and bathrooms <laughs> i tried to buy as much bottled coke as possible to get us through to offset the water purchase and accelerate the end of the contract but i can only i can only consume so much um, so thank you uh counselor thank you kate appreciate as always again you being here and that is it for delegations. So uh, we can now move to questions to staff. And we have uh, a number of individuals here, obviously Nicole and Shelly, as you saw earlier, um, Kevin Wiley's here, Marilyn Journeau, Andrew Flowers, who obviously leads our climate and resilience team. Uh, Will McDonald, I mentioned, uh, Chief Procurement Officer. So a number of, uh, number of individuals here to be able to answer uh, questions that you may have uh, on a variety of topics. So don't all put your hand up at once. Oh, there we go, Councilor Menard. I'll start, sure. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, so really appreciate this report, first of all, and all the work that has gone into it. Um, there's a lot moving through the city right now. Uh, this particular report, though, um, has a lot of outlay and time in front of us to get it right and to work with our communities and, and, and uh, uh, others to, to make sure we're, we're delivering for, for folks here and that there's a need to change. I read uh, Randall Denley's article recently and um, I think it's important to recognize that uh, regardless of where we go in the next little while, just simply saying we're just going to keep adding landfills and adding landfills or you know other <laughs> technologies and incineration sort of thing and just accepting the problem as it is isn't going to work. There needs to be some change. We need to uh, we need to do more uh, reducing, reusing, recycling, and of course, moving towards that circular economy, regardless of other landfill sites or other technologies that emerge. This is important for us to move towards that. So, um, I think uh, staff have done a really good job and have put a lot of effort into where we are today. So, thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, I just, I'll go through a few questions. I mentioned them in the delegations that I would be asking around them. So um, in terms of um, the, I'll start on the procurement policy. I know Will, Will is here. Is, is there a move afoot? And I know we've talked about this before uh, in the development of a more zero waste green procurement policy that, that would encourage uh, things like the purchase of materials uh, with recycled content uh, and a consideration of this um, for the future. How are we going about that work um, to, to match what our goals are in this in this plan? So, Mr. Chair, there's uh, there's really two elements that that relate to this. The first is that there there is an update to the sustainable procurement guidelines that is ongoing as a result of direction from uh, council. In addition, um, the policies that underpin a lot of the work of the operational areas inform what happens. And uh, as an example, things like the green building policy have an impact on the type of structures that are being developed and the specifications that inform them. And so these are really important that they happen in tandem because as a zero emission bus report highlighted, there are several operational considerations that need to be assessed in developing a procurement strategy. And so they can't be done in isolation. The operational areas have the te technical expertise and market knowledge to identify sustainable criteria that work with their operational requirements. And so it, what uh, we're proposing is not a blanket procurement policy 
but uh, a combination of both uh, specification development and procurement methodologies that would uh, drive council's uh, desired outcome. That's great to hear. Uh, is there going to be a focus on uh, on zero waste or that as a goal um, through all, all of our procurement? I know you're saying not a specific policy, but how, how are you going to focus on that? What, what are we going to do in terms of talking to staff to make sure that that is a priority? So, Mr. Chair, I don't think that could be directed at the procurement level. I think this needs to be done in tandem with the operational areas and the procurement process developed to achieve the objectives of the project at hand. And so where a decision is made to uh, procure in a, in a zero waste, uh, spe with a zero waste specification, the procurement policy would be developed to, uh, to mirror that and to achieve that objective. Okay, thanks very much, Will. I, I appreciate that. Um, there's another question that was asked during the delegations or, or referenced around the baseline uh, greenhouse gas analysis of, of current waste management system um, and how critical that's going to be in terms of conducting a, a comparative assessment um, and the impact of the proposed options, which is, which is part of our assessment criteria, of course. Um, so, you know, Waste Watch Ottawa has mentioned that the data has, uh, has been talked about before, but hasn't been released yet. I'm wondering if we can get an update from staff on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so, Mr. Chair, um, that is a deliverable, yes, that the, um, the technical consulting team has worked on. So, undertaking that baseline modeling of our existing system. So, we do intend on um, meeting with the stakeholder sounding board later this summer as an opportunity to work through some of the contents that have been shared today as part of the phase two uh, master plan report. And we'll also be looking to share um, the results of the GHG baseline information. And then moving forward is part of the next stage um, of the master planning process is once we're evaluating and shortlisting those options into those two moderate and aggressive scenarios, we'll then be able to model out the greenhouse gas emissions uh, potential, those two different scenarios to be able to compare that to the baseline. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to also touch on the, the waste diversion targets. So um, we are obviously striving for a zero waste future. Um, and that is important. Um, but of course, it will take a lot of time to, to get anywhere close to that. And so those progressive targets as we move along is going to be important, obviously in our, our landfill life, but, but uh, uh, for other reasons as well. So um, I, I just wonder in terms of where we are now, which is you know low to, low to mid 40% and, and some other cities achieving a much higher diversion target, how, how are we going to be... In, implementing our own targets? What, what, are the, what is the public going to see? Uh, and uh, how are we making those um, you know, part of this, this plan moving forward? Thank you, Councillor. So, Mr. Chair, that is part of, I guess, the next stage of the master plan process um, that we will be working with the community and stakeholders as part of the next engagement series, um, seeking their input on um, proposed um, targets. So once we are shortlisting the options and putting together the moderate and aggressive scenarios, we'll also be developing a suite of um, proposed targets, um, working alongside our um, stakeholder sounding board uh, later this summer as well to have conversations on that. And that of course will, once we're, we're seeking that input from the community um, in terms of those targets, they will make their way into the, uh, the recommended draft strategy as that opportunity to um, recognizing where those targets are and what the different performance measures and, and how we're ranking that regular performance reporting in terms of what the targets are that we've set out to achieve. Thanks very much, Nicole. And my last question, Chair, is just around uh, some of our, I guess, our need to move quickly on some of these aspects. And I, and I say that on some of the simple, simple, simple ones <laughs> that, that I think are slam dunks. They meet our criteria. They're, they're, they're right there. So, um, <clears throat> Just in terms of timeline, are we going to see any changes to our own waste uh, management systems prior to the start of uh, the next term of council? So, you know, I think we said Q1 2023 is when the final decision will be made. Will we be seeing any other changes made in the interim? Of course, the provincial government has has a say in all of this, and our our producer responsibility changes. But but what could Ottawans expect before? Q1 2023, if anything, that may be slam dunks and, and 
we know that they meet all the criteria that's been established and, and should start to be implemented. So thank you, Councillor um, and Mr. Chair. So of course, in terms of all the options that we've identified in the master plan, you're absolutely right there. There definitely are some short term win opportunities. So we're, we're looking forward to that conversation, that dialogue with the community later this fall. Um, but as you'll recall, there are a number of component projects that are underway. So most notably looking at advancing um, both engagement and development of or implementation of a new curbside uh, diversion policy that would look at short-term implementation opportunities to help further drive diversion. We also have the uh, multi-residential diversion strategy. Um, both of those we're looking forward to bring forward for council consideration Q1 of next year. And again, they both complement and support. Um, they're not competing with the direction of the waste plan. Um, and in addition, the, the residuals management strategy um, that we touched on through the, the presentation and also looking at advancing that and looking for those short-term opportunities that we can implement, all with the goal of trying to further increase diversion, waste reduction efforts, and, and also extending the life of the trail of that bill. Thank you. That is very clear and uh, really appreciate um, those responses. Um, I see the chair stepped away, so maybe I'll just, uh, um, if people can, committee can indulge me, I'll just go to, I believe Councillor McKenney uh, had their hand up first. And there's, there's a, okay, <laughs> I see the chair come back. Councillor McKenney, uh, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And uh, yes, thank you to, to staff for this. Um, I was briefed and my uh, office was at the, uh, at the briefing as well, the second round. So um, we have uh, um, been, been involved over the past couple of weeks and, and looked through this. And, um, you know, from, in terms of, you know, our, our moving forward and just the way, the shift in the way that we're thinking about waste uh, has changed um, as, as a city uh, and, and, and as a council, um, significantly, even just in the last three, four years. Um, so I, I really do uh, appreciate this uh, and the, the work and the, the, the effort that has gone into ensuring that at the very least, we know what we can do to significantly reduce um, our, our waste and, um, and that going into our landfill. Um, but it, we also need to, you know, reduce uh, what we what, just uh, what we consume. And and I want to just get back to the the plastic water bottles and the uh, uh, just the the whole notion of that behavioral change and uh, um, and talking about our water and how we promote our our water at the city. Um, I understand that the budget for water promotion right now is um, $100,000. That's, uh, there's Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Counselor. Hi. So, so it's 100,000, but we haven't been spending that uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and is that, that's, just get you to confirm that and just talk about what some of the barriers have been, uh, Kevin, to, um, you know, spending that money and, and, and having a, a real campaign for, for water promotion. Certainly, Chair. Um, following the direction of 2019, staff went back and refreshed the uh, promotion of drinking water strategy, and we were ready to go in 2020. And a lot of the strategy revolved around face-to-face -face interactions with the public at the various events we go to, et cetera. And unfortunately, COVID hit. So, and and a lot of our promotion is seasonal. We we really gear up for sort of the spring summer season. So, with COVID hitting, that was all suspended. Um, now we're we're hoping next year we won't have that COVID issue, and we'll be refreshing the strategy yet again, uh, coming up with some uh, novel ways of promoting drinking water and. Uh, I'm, I'm confident we'll have a robust campaign next next year. Unfortunately, COVID's just been something that's curtailed a lot of our promotion on a lot of fronts. And, and Kevin, what, what was the uh, shortfall in terms of what you spent out of that $100,000? Um, over the last couple of years? Yeah. Um, 
approximately. Yeah, we uh, 2020, we could only spend 32,000 out of the 100,000 uh, so far to date again, uh, because COVID's curtailed all, almost all of the activities. We've only spent about 10,000. Okay. What happens to that money? Like, what do we... So just stay in your general revenue. Like, is it is it available as we're coming out of COVID, as we're opening up patios and doing a bit more outdoor activity? Like, is, is it is it available to us to, to start available. some of that promotion? It's available for this budget year, absolutely. So as things start to open up, we can kickstart the campaign. That's not a problem. Um, year over year, as you're aware, Chair, the operational budget will roll over. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, you know, I talked to your staff and, you know, we a good conversation. I'd like to see more money in, in water promotion. And I, I don't want to set up staff to, to fail, obviously. I think that, that we need to be uh, reasonable in, in our expectations today. But um, I think that going forward, um, what I'd like to see um, is, you know, um, like a, a strategy, like to, to come back to us with a strategy on what that could look like, what some of the new ways of promoting our, our own water could look like. Um, and, um, and just so that we, we can be informed of what you need to, so that we can increase uh, the amount of people using our water and la using bottled water, um, you know, having that decrease. So, is that possible to, uh, to be able to come back to us? Um, I'll let you, um, you know, uh, suggest a timeline, but to, to have that uh, information for us as we as we move forward. As yeah, we certainly. Into COVID. Certainly, Chair uh, Jen Carrera is on on the call here, and she's in charge of the the water uh, drinking water promotion. Um, I think, in, unless she tells me otherwise, I think that we could come back, uh, say, late summer, early fall with a robust strategy. We'll, we'll, we'll start with what we had planned to do and couldn't do during COVID, and, and we'll build from there. Okay, okay. I, I, perfect. I mean, I, I, I look forward to that because I think that, again, if, if, if you don't have what you need, if you don't have the resources that you need, I get today we have COVID, so things have you know, have, have got put on to the side uh, because we aren't having those face-to-face -face interactions. But if moving forward, uh, you don't have what you need to do the promotion that, that certainly I'm looking for and, and, and I think other committee members, uh, then it's, you know, incumbent upon us to, to see what that looks like and then determine what the, uh, the budget ask would be, uh, what, what, what you require. So, so I look forward to that and, uh, and uh, appreciate the, uh, the information today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And thanks to Councillor, my, my, my reliable Vice Chair for stepping in for me I, to take an important phone call about a, a child who's having difficulty pooping. It's, you know, I know you guys look at me and you're like, I just wish I could live his life. It's just, it's a dream. Um, okay. Our next counselor up is Councillor Hubley. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate the chance to follow up with staff. Uh, I'd like to get their observations uh, based on the um, both the land era presentation if there was uh, anything in there that they would want to bring to our attention uh, any concerns or any any positives out of it I, I certainly appreciate and also get them to expand a bit on uh, the notion uh, you suggested about having multiple pilots uh, underway So, uh, thank you, Councillor. So, Mr. Chair, I guess first and foremost, you know, at this part in the master planning process, we are investigating a number of different types of technologies um, and their particular ability to meet the city's future needs. So, we're not yet at that stage um, where we're confirming the types of technology. So, again, we're, we're looking forward to that discussion with the community um, um, as we engage further this fall. Um, you know, at this point, you're going to see um, 
in particular related to the Lendero technology. It does fall into one of the options um, that are, is included within the master plan and the long list, and that's looking at some of those emerging technologies. Um, and of course, you know, if there is interest and support from council, it's, it's something that we, we can facilitate the demonstration of, um, you know, some of these emerging technologies that aren't quite proven at the, the scale required for the city's needs. Um, and one of those options that covers that is the innovation and technology stra uh, strategy option. So that opens the door to that opportunity to look at um, the potential for demonstrating um, some of these different um, pilot based technologies. So using the city's existing buffer lands um, in and around the trailways landfill as an example. Um, so you'll see outlined in that particular strategy, the recommendation to develop a, a, a framework and a, and a procurement approach um, to making sure that um, again, we're, we're looking at different technologies that can potentially meet our unique needs identified through the master plan and also recognizing that there are a number of, of technologies and companies um, out in, in the market. So making sure that we're opening it up to that competitive process. So, and oh, sorry, go ahead, Nicole. I thought you were done. No problem, Councillor. And in particular, I, I think to the presentation, obviously, um, you know, sparking our interest, we definitely have a lot of questions. Um, in terms of that technology. Um, and, you know, there would be some work, of course, to, to understand and confirm the different regulatory requirements um, and, you know, interest in understanding to where they're at in terms of those discussions with, with the ministry. Um, given their technology is something in place in Tennessee, which has a very different regulatory um, um, jurisdiction in comparison to Ontario. Okay, thank you. Uh the only concern I have with what you just said is the, earlier in the, your in the staff presentation, we talked about how uh, we are quickly running out of space at Trail Road, and I'm not getting a sense of any urgency in trying to uh, see if we can find different pilot projects to address this concern. And so I'm wondering um, if we should be looking at some sort of expedited process uh, and procurement process uh, that we could get into uh, running several different pilots so that we have time to uh, make sure we don't run out of capacity at Trail Road. How do we go about doing that, Nicole? So thank you, Councillor and um, Mr. Chair. So you know, just going back to the master plan itself, you know, there's just out of the over 70 options, you have about 32 or just over 30 that are directly related to opportunities to increase diversion and increasing the life of landfill. So there's a lot more opportunities above and beyond piloting different, um, you know, alternative approaches to managing waste, um, 19 of them as well that have an indirect impact. And perhaps maybe Shelley, I'm not sure if you want to touch on the residual management strategy and how that could fit into advancing what the councillor's touching on. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, for the, the question. Yes, absolutely. So, so council through Nicole's presentation today, uh, we are bringing back this fall the the roadmap for the residual management. And as Nicole as Nicole had mentioned, um, there there are a number of of items uh, that we can explore and also bring back uh, for committee and council's consideration. Uh, so we are kind of at the at the beginning um but recognizing that uh, we do have time and we are advancing that residual of management in order to make sure that we're exploring everything that's possible so as nicole touched upon there are quite a few options that that will support our diversion efforts uh technology certainly is one of them and that is one of the options that, that we did highlight uh, in the residual management in order to explore to see how we can advance in order to make sure that we're being open and transparent uh, and because the, as Nicole mentioned there could be other parties out there as well so we want to make sure that we're bringing as many possibilities to the table. I absolutely agree and uh, you know as we talked about in the presentation we definitely have to be looking at different uh, technologies here nobody wants to put all the eggs in that one basket. What kind of timeline are you talking about, Shelley? Because we, we heard in the example of Landera, and I would imagine another, um, a lot of the other technologies would be the same, that they're going to need, you know, two years or more to, to ramp up from the time we do an agreement. So how much time in advance of doing agreements do we need internally to get to that point? So, uh, Chair, if you recall, we're, we're 
bringing forward the roadmap this fall, 2021, and then a Folsom strategy in 2022. So within that Folsom strategy, uh, we could be bringing back uh, the, the framework uh, in order to be bringing those technology companies on board. So with that time frame and aligning with what we heard from Landera today and possibly others, uh, we could be uh, bringing new proponents on board within five years, right? So I, I think I think the timing aligns very, very well with us advancing the residual management strategy. So uh, to make sure I heard you clearly, so five years on our part to get to the point to where we could uh, enter into negotiations to start a pilot that would then take another two or more years to, to take place. So we're now really at the end of the life of Trail Road. No, sorry, Councillor, I, I misspoke on that. So basically, if we're bringing forward the, the final framework for the residual management in 2022, that we, we then could be at the point that we're engaging in conversations with the technology providers. Uh, and so basically not five years out, but potentially assuming that they're able to just start up as quickly as, as, they, as they indicate, we could have uh, pilots on the ground operational in five years. Okay, much better. Okay, thank you, uh, Shelly. I, I want to end that on a, a good note. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair. Uh, today I heard that the trail road life cycle is now going to come to an end between 2036 and 2038. Are those dates correct? So, uh, Chair, um, as Nicole alluded to in the presentation, if we maintain the same level of diversion, uh, same level level of consumption, um, based on, uh, on on a status quo, uh, the trail road could reach capacity between 2026 and 2038. Okay, so based on today's data, what we know today, that, and those timelines have been amended because for years. In recent years, we were talking 23, 24 years away. Now we're down to 15 to 17. So what's happened? Uh, thank you, Chair, for the question. So as, as indicated back in July of 2019, when we presented the roadmap report, we did identify at that point that we may come across areas where we're not following best practice. So as we were preparing of the, the phase two work, uh, we took a look at uh, how we're determining uh, the life expectancy of the trail road landfill. And we realized that we're using a compliance measure, which is not a best practice when it comes to planning. So, and, and that spurred the, uh, the, the recommendation to advance a residual management strategy which among other things, looking at uh, other opportunities to extend the landfill life, would also be looking at how best to um, uh, quantify uh, the dynamic nature of landfill operations. So coming up with a, uh, a calculation and approach um, that provides uh, uh, greater certainty um, that we're able to report back on so that way we're able to provide council with the necessary information in order to, to take any course corrections that are required. Uh, so just to kind of wrap that up a little bit, I, I said quite a bit there. Um, we recognize that uh, through the roadmap report that we may not be following best practices. Um, how we've been quantifying the life of the landfill is one of them. And through the residual management strategy, we are going to be looking at from a planning perspective, what uh, method should we be uh, putting forward to calculate remaining life? Thank you. I appreciate the explanation. It's great to have the most revised data this problem is a lot more serious than I thought it was just months ago. If we have potentially 15 years left of our landfill, then we do have a serious problem before us. And if I heard you correctly today during our first delegation or someone said that you need 15 years, up to 15 years of ramp on ramp, if we are going, if the city and I, this is, I'm absolutely opposed to this, but if we are going to create a new landfill, you need up to 15 years of time to do that. Is that correct? So it can take 12 to 15 years to, to site a new landfill. So recognizing uh, uh, four years just to identify the, the property uh, could be up to six years in order to receive the, um, the EA approval. And then to anywhere from two to five years in order to prepare the site for accepting the, the waste. 
Uh, so it could take 12 to 15 years starting from scratch uh, to, to site and open a new landfill. So that, that underscores the critical nature that the roadmap and the fulsome strategy that you alluded to has to produce concrete measures. We, we have to chip away at, we have to divert as much as we can and we have to chip away because we have to extend the lifetime of the landfill. So I, I appreciate that. The main questions my colleagues have, or sorry, that my, my residents have, you've answered that that is one of the next steps. You've talked about the roadmap later this year and then the fulsome strategy, which I think members of the public um, will be very interested in because they want to see the nuts and bolts about what's being contemplated and expected. But definitely changing behavior, continuing to change behavior and reducing what we use to begin with and creating waste is uh, it's paramount what we have to do. So thank you for all the efforts that have gone into this thus far. This is a very serious issue. Um, a lot of people just think that when they put things at the end of the curb, you know, they don't see it anymore and they don't really care where it goes. But uh, garbage is still a very serious issue and we cannot be planning for a new landfill. We have to look at ways to divert, to send less to the landfill and think of new innovative ways to deal with it than simply creating a mountain and putting soil on top and forgetting about it. So thank you to staff for your good work on this. Great, uh, thank you so much, Councillor Brockington. Uh, we move now to Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'd really like to uh, uh, send uh, my appreciation to staff and acknowledge uh, the, the depth and breadth of the uh, report that they have provided to us. I had a number of questions on, on uh, that package that was sent. Um, firstly, based on the report, uh, we see that the uh, roadmap uh, for the residual waste management strategy uh, should come back to the committee in the fall as uh, had been noted by staff before and I think responses uh, to uh, Councillor Hubley. I'm just interested as well in that timeline. Uh, will that strategy be approved ahead of the solid waste master plan allowing for a more accurate estimation of the capacity at trail road in the final plan? So I'm just wondering about um, um, the timeline and uh, whether we will have uh, the tools really to to have a a good estimation of, on capacity. Thanks, Chair, for that question. Yes, yeah, so the intent is to bring back the the roadmap report uh, in the fall, uh, and then immediately upon uh, committee and council's approval, start to to prepare prepare that residual management strategy and bringing that back in Q4 2022. So that will be in advance of when we're bringing forward the the final uh, draft plan and implementation plan for the solid waste master plan, which will happen the following quarter in 2023. Thank you for that. I, I also uh, recognize that uh, there was uh, the potential for a future organics processing capacity project. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, that uh, could be a, a large element to uh, what we're trying to address in, in terms of uh, waste management in the city. I was just wondering if uh, staff plans to uh, uh, provide briefings to uh, councillors and to uh, really facilitate a, a larger uh, discussion uh, both amongst uh, members of council and the general public on that project. Uh, thank you, Councillor and Mr. Chair. Um, absolutely. So that, um, as you had referenced, the uh, post, we're about nine years away from the end of our current contract with our organics processing um, technology provider. So that recognizing, again, the, the lead up and approval times, uh, depending on the ultimate technology choice as well as the procurement choice, um, it could take anywhere from five to seven years to um, develop and have a new facility in place. Um, so given that kit, staff uh, will be kickstarting work in concert with the master plan on determining um, what that next um, technology, but also procurement approach will be for council's consideration. So it will really dovetail um, again with the work that's done through the master plan to date. So you will have noticed um, on the long list of options, there are a number of different options that, that we can contemplate and consider moving um, forward as options to, to manage and process organic waste. Um, but absolutely, if that's, there's an interest by members of committee and council, we, we absolutely can set up um, individual briefings, um, you know, to, to walk through the details of that project in more depth. 
We'd appreciate that because I, I think that we have to examine uh, all the options on the table, all the innovations and in, in all the technologies and, and uh, view them through the lens of uh, what uh, we might be controlling directly, uh, what might be outsourced, and uh, also uh, through the lens of uh, the environmental impacts, ultimately, uh, whether uh, that's greenhouse gas emissions uh, or uh, greenhouse gas inputs as well, and, and what the consumption levels of, of that are. Um, the next question I had was, uh, and observation, is that the consultation on the moderate versus aggressive systems options are described as deciding how fast and how far we can collectively want to move as a community. And given Council's declaration of a climate emergency, it seems like the question should be how fast and how far do we have to move collectively. So assuming these two uh, systems, uh, these two approaches, moderate and aggressive, are more of a continuum to illustrate options rather than a binary choice. How can those systems be framed around the urgency of meeting the, the city's uh, energy evolution targets? Um, thank you, Councillor, good question. Um, so Mr. Chair, in, in terms of the, the two, the moderate and aggressive scenarios, I think there's, there's a couple of different things that it will come down to is schedule cost performance and some of the, the logistics, mainly in and around, you know, the availability and capacity of staff to be prioritizing these different initiatives. So in terms of schedule, you know, the moderate implementation approach might be something that takes a little bit longer to achieve um, within the 30 year time frame versus more aggressively um, implementing some of the actions in the shorter term. Um, very similar with the cost is um, a moderate approach to implementation might see a, a situation where those, those annualized costs, um, they're, you know, they're spread out um, and less aggressive kind of in the earlier um, areas of the master plan. Um, some of those important discussions to come with the community um, you know, we're recognizing that there, there's a lot of change um, that this plan is representing from the community. And a lot of part of that discussion, especially on those elements that will require public behavior change, it's, it's getting an understanding of how quickly residents are willing to buy into the different options and consider undertaking their part um, to move forward um, in the change. So I think going back to to one of the core goals um, of that is being proposed for committee and council's consideration is being um, aligning with the, the climate change um, targets. A number of the different options identified include those that were um, identified through the energy evolution strategy. So those are all options that you know we will have the conversations with the community um, this this fall. Okay, just want to clarify, of course, we're going to have a public consultation, but uh, do both of the moderate and aggressive approaches meet the city's energy evolution targets of 100% uh, GHG emissions? Is that, uh, and reductions, is that the ultimate goal of, of both? Or would we have to apply the aggressive approach to, to meet uh, those emission targets? A great question, Councillor. So um, for clarification, both scenarios will consider um, the different options identified um, to meet Council's climate change targets. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to ask a, a sub question of, of something from, from uh, that. You mentioned the residual waste uh, management strategy is going to come back in Q4 of 2022. I'm going to break that down in eighths. Is it E7 or E8? Because it's a significant difference. If you're aware of what happens on November 15th, 2022. Oh, great point. Great point. Okay. So we can we talk about it afterwards. It's not it's not the end of the world. I just it's a, it's obviously council changes over on November 15th, 2022. Yeah, um, because of the because of the change from uh, the provincial government is no longer December 1st, the end of term, uh, the start of the next term. It's now November 15th, which is only like the elections, October 24th, 2022. There's only 20 days between the election and the term, the next term of council. It's a little bit, a little bit odd. Um, 
might be worthwhile if that strategy could come forward a little earlier, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. And we can talk about that further. Obviously, this is something that, that involves this council sponsors group on solid waste as well with myself and Council Menard and Council Alshantiri and Dudas. Um, but then also with the roadmap coming, we're going to, we're going to discuss this further in the fall. Um, so, so that's good. I appreciate that. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions from members of a committee. Um, really want to thank uh, committee members today. I think your engagement, thoughtful engagement uh, questions, um, all quite pertinent and very, uh, very good to the discussion, very helpful for our staff and our team that's leading this. Uh, Shelly Nicole, phenomenal job, as always. Um, been great to work with you on this file for the last uh, couple of years and looking forward to, well, the whole strategy comes next term, but but uh, <laughs> looking forward to seeing it the rest of this term. Um, so thank you. I don't have any other, um, again, so no other questions from the committee. Let me just bring my agenda back up on the screen. I have like 6,000 windows open. Oh, there it is. Okay, so, um, oh, first the amendment from, has everyone reviewed that? Everyone's okay with that that minor technical amendment? Okay, good. Uh, appreciate that. So on that amendment, is that carried? Carried. Okay. And then the, the plan itself, so that Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management, recommend that Council 1 approve the vision statement, guiding principles and goals of the Solid Waste Master Plan as described in this report and outlined supporting document 1 and 2. Receive the Solid Waste Master Plan Phase 2 report and supporting documents relating to the City of Ottawa's long-term waste management strategy, sorry, waste management needs, and the high-level long list of options to meet future needs in the evaluation process to evaluate the options as attached in document 2 through 4 for information. Is that uh, carried as amended? Carried as amended. Thank you very much. So we move on to item 2 which is the same cast of characters. We still have Shelly here with us. Item two is Solid Waste Services 2023 Residential Curbside Collection Contract Procurement Strategy. So I imagine Shelly will cue this up, but you'll recall a couple years ago, we did extend the contracts. We're still operating under the contracts from 2012. And we did extend those contracts uh, and this is before us again to do the same. And I'll allow uh, Shelly to explain that, their rationale and what um, what those options are. Thank you, Chair. So as mentioned today, we're presenting our recommendation for the 2023 residual curbside collection contract procurement strategy. So staff are recommending an approach for our curbside collections contract that gives council flexibility as we move forward with the solid waste master plan while ensuring uninterrupted collection services to residents. Staff's recommendation is being made with, sev with several factors in mind, including the uncertainties around the provincial transition to IPR for the blue and black box program, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on both the residential waste streams and the market conditions affecting equipment lead times, as well as the alignment between the solid waste master plan timelines and the desire of council to implement recommended changes as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Through the residential curbside collection contract, the city is responsible for the curbside collection of blue and black box recyclables, green bin organics, leaf and yard waste, garbage, and bulky items from approximately 294,000 residential homes as required required and regulated by provincial legislation. The city also provides curbside collection services to 190 city-owned facilities, 550 small businesses through the city's yellow bag program, and approximately 240 schools with green bin collection through the city's green bins and schools program. Next slide, please. It costs Costs on average approximately 44.6 million a year to collect waste under the current contract, which includes both single family and multi residential homes receiving curbside collection services. The city is split into five zones to facilitate the collection. Three are managed by Miller Waste, and two zones are serviced by our in house collection group, which includes the downtown core. The service levels for our current collections contract are based on those established and approved by Council in 2011. 
As the chair mentioned, in 2019, we received approval for a three-year sole source contract that began on June 1st, 2020. We have completed the first year of this contract and it is set to expire on June the 4th, 2023. Council approval was required today for staff to negotiate and award contracts by Q3 2021 so that service providers have sufficient time to procure collection equipment ahead of the June the 5th, 2023 start date. Next slide, please. As staff are preparing for the approach for the current contract as presented in the staff report, we took into account three key considerations in an options analysis process. The first was the transition to IPR for the Provincial Blue Box program. The final Blue Box regulations were released on June the 3rd. Staff are currently reviewing them to understand the impacts. We want to make sure that our residents continue to receive curbside services for all streams, garbage, organics, bulky, leaf and yard, and recycling. The timing of the transition in the regulation indicates that the City of Ottawa must transition to IPR on July the 1st, 2023, but the details of what that looks like are still unknown. Staff also considered the timing to implement policy changes from the Solid Waste Master Plan. The committee also considered the Solid Waste Master Plan Phase 2 report today. We will be bringing to Council by early Q2 2022 the Phase 3 of the Solid Waste Master Plan and then again in Q1 2023 to present the draft strategy and the five-year implementation plan. Lastly was the current market conditions including both the supply chain and the COVID-19 impacts. Typically, the standard industry lead time to procure collection equipment once contracts have been awarded could be up to 18 months. COVID-19 has had impacts on the supply chain and contracts need to be awarded as soon as possible to mitigate the risk of collection equipment delays. We have also seen a volumetric shift of industrial, commercial and institutional waste to the residential waste stream, with more residents working from home as a result of the pandemic and stay at home orders. We're not sure if this trend will continue, which could have long-term impacts on our waste collection system and contracts. Analysis to understand the impacts to our collections contract will need to be done once we return to our new normal. This cannot be done in time to issue a contract for 2023. These considerations all pose a form of risk. Typically, these can be mitigated through options included in the contract. With more variables comes increased costs, and these would be borne by the city. Therefore, the longer the contract, the higher financial burden the city could bear. Next slide, please. Based on the key considerations, the city has two options. To issue a tender for a standard five-year competitive contract with two one-year extension options. This would run until at least June the 4th, 2028. And if we exercise those two one-year extensions would take us to June the 2nd, 2030. The second and recommended approach is to issue a two year sole source contract with our existing service providers that would lead to the benefits which I'll detail further for you in the next few slides. Next slide please. This slide highlights the important solid waste milestones that are being undertaken over the next few years. Two of the key considerations that were touched upon previously are also shown the solid waste master plan and the blue box transition. This visual helps to demonstrate why staff are recommending the two-year collection contract and share the approach for the development of specifics for a new collection contract post-2025. I'd like to spend a few minutes reviewing each of these with you at a high level so that you can see how the two-year contract strategy will align nicely to where we are currently in our solid waste planning cycle and where we intend to be by 2023 through to 2026. Today, we, were bringing, we brought two reports forward for your consideration, the Phase 2 Solid Waste Master Plan and the 2023 Curbside Collection Procurement Strategy Report. Pending approval of both, both will rise to Council on July the 7th. Approval of the recommended short-term procurement strategy for 2023 will allow sufficient time to secure the new collection equipment and also enable staff to immediately begin planning and working on developing a more fulsome procurement strategy for the 2025 collections contract. In early October, staff will bring forward an update for committee and council on the blue box transition to IPR. At a high level, this update will provide council with a fulsome understanding of the blue box IPR impacts on the city's waste collection process and include next steps for determining future recommendations for consideration. 
As a reminder, the producers have sole responsibility for determining what the new Blue Box program will look like and whether or not they wish to work with municipalities. We intend to initiate discussions with the producers shortly and um, into early 2022. And currently without a full understanding of the direction that the producers will want to take, the city cannot determine how best to undertake collection services during the transition period, beginning on July 1st, 2023. Potential scenarios, we could be in or out of the recycling business, will be developed by staff and brought forward for council consideration in late 2022. These scenarios will consider collection costs, service level expectations, and outcomes from our discussions with the producers. This fall, staff will also launch the Solid Waste Master Plan Engagement Series 2. By the end of the year, staff will conclude this engagement and prepare to bring forward phase three of the master plan for consideration by committee and council in early 2022. Shortly thereafter, engagement series three will launch, which will include consulting on the draft solid waste master plan. Staff will bring forward the solid waste, draft, solid waste master plan draft strategy and the five-year implementation plan in Q1 of 2023. This strategy will have key elements that will inform the next strategy for our residential collection contract. Staff will begin developing the next residential collection contract immediately following approval of the short-term contract. And we intend to bring it forward to committee and council for consideration in Q2 2023. July 1st, 2023 is the targeted IPR transition date for the city of Ottawa. As and as previously described, the implications of the state in terms of a collection contract are not yet known. Then in June 2025 will be the end of the two year short term contract and the beginning of a new standard term contract pending council approval for the strategy in 2023. Next slide please. The recommended two year sole source contract would be with the existing vendors Miller Waste and the in house team and would maintain the 2011 council approved service levels that exist under the current contract. The contract will go until June the 8th, 2025, which provides for many benefits. Alignment with the solid waste master plan milestones, providing council with the ability to implement desired outcomes beginning in 2025 and earlier compared to if the city were to issue a longer term contract beginning in 2023. Alignment with the anticipated full provincial transition to IPR in 2026, while providing flexibility to make earlier contract amendments if required. Known financial impacts for curbside residents based on the recent vendor pricing submissions for the two year contract term. This provides staff with known pricing for which to enter into discussions with producers for the collection of blue and black box materials, should this be the direction given by Council. Sufficient time to procure new collection equipment, mitigating potential service disruptions to residents. And finally, providing more time and resources to consider the implications of IPR, the Solid Waste Master Plan, and to execute a service level options review, all of which would be used to develop the long-term procurement strategy for the next curbside collection contract, targeted to be procured in 2023 for a June 2025 start date. While this approach has many benefits, there are a few risks to consider, including the consideration that any major and desired changes stemming from the Solid Waste Master Plan or its component projects would need to wait until June 2025. While we raise this as a risk, it's understood that it can take 18 months to two years to see behavioral change. Staff are confident that we can start incorporating council approved curbside diversion options and possibly other policy options prior to the contract rollout, using this time to educate residents on the changes first. The potential for some operational and financial risks associated with IPR transition, including we still may need to make contract modifications if IPR transition impacts the current blue and black box services prior to 2025 within the short term contract. And because we didn't do a competitive tender, there is some uncertainty that we may that we received the best value for the city when compared to a five year competitive bid with multiple off ramps. It's worth noting, however, the short term approach is being recommended in order to mitigate increased financial risk to the city over a longer period due to the many unknowns associated with IPR. Next slide, please. The report is recommending that council delegate authority to staff to negotiate, finalize and execute a two year residential curbside collection contract with each of the existing curbside vendors. Based on the binding prices from the two vendors, 
we anticipate a 5.6% increase of $8.50 in 2023 to the average homeowner and a 3.4% increase of $5.10 in 2024. The cost in 2023 includes the pricing of the current three-year contract that ends on June 4th and the cost associated with this two-year sole source contract. It's expected that under both a short and a standard term contract, costs will increase. Information from the 2018 RFI process and current analysis done by staff have confirmed the cost increases to be reasonable in comparison to the current market. Noting also that the cost increase for the proposed short term contracts is less than the increases seen under the current term contract. Any off ramps added into the contracts, for example, to accommodate the IPR transition, pose more risk to the provider and in turn increase the costs, which are borne by the city. Therefore, the, the longer contract would result in higher prices for a longer period of time. That is why staff, upon receiving pricing from our current vendors and having assessed the impact of current unknowns, continue to recommend a, a short-term contract to mitigate any increased costs. We understand from colleagues and other cities who have put out standard-term contracts that they have experienced higher prices. One such example is an over 10% increase year over year for a three term for a three year contract. Next slide please. The in house group has identified the need to procure 22 replacement vehicles and two additional vehicles for growth in zone five. Before procuring this equipment, staff will evaluate lease and purchase options to determine the best path forward to mitigate the risks of IPR and, the redu and reduce the cost over the term of the contract. If the best option is to lease, there'll be no 2022 capital budget implications, as well as no 2021 nor 2022 operational budget impacts since these contracts start in 2023. Operating budget impacts for 2023 and beyond will be incorporated in the draft operating budgets for each respective year, subject to annual inflationary and growth increases per year per the terms and conditions of the contract. If purchasing, funding will be requested as part of the 2022 budget process in the 2022 Municipal Fleet Vehicle and Equipment Replacement and Growth Plan, which is published as information supplemental to the budget. The procurement of these new vehicles combined with the previously purchased new vehicles in 2019 will help to mitigate and reduce significant fleet maintenance costs over the term of the proposed two-year contract. Next slide, please. Therefore, we're recommending that Council delegate authority to the General Manager of the Public Works and Environmental Services Department to negotiate, finalize, and execute a short-term two-year residential curbside collection contract with each of the existing curbside collection service providers, including the in-house group, in accordance with the procurement bylaw uh, section 221D. With this approval, we will finalize and execute contracts with vendors by Q3 2021. Additionally, we'll procure required equipment based on the best option to minimize costs and reduce risks over the term of the contract. Some other key deliverables going forward will be understand the implications of IPR and communicate these with council as soon as possible develop a plan for the service level options review, continue work on the solid waste master plan with a target to bring the draft and five-year implementation plan forward to council consideration in Q1 2023, all of which will inform the development of a fulsome procurement strategy for the 2025 curbside collection contract that solid waste staff will begin working on immediately following approval of the short-term strategy and bring forward for council consideration in the middle of 2023. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, questions from committee members or anyone? Uh, Councilor Aguilar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, just a quick question. Uh, is there any, any legal risk to the city um, from other players in the industry if we go straight to a sole source as opposed to going out uh, for a public uh, procurement? Short answer, no. Long answer, Nas. Yes, Mr. Chair. We at this point we haven't identified any legal impediments to this approach that, that staff are recommending. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Regler. Any other questions? Any other questions? 
going twice. Any other questions going three times? No? All right, then. Thank you for that uh, very thorough uh, presentation, uh, quite detailed, and obviously answered questions before they were even asked. Uh, so the recommendation before us then is that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water, and Waste Management recommend that Council delegate the authority to the General Manager of Public Works and Environmental Services Department to negotiate, finalize, and execute a short-term two-year residential curbside collection contract with each of the existing curbside collection service providers, including the in-house collections group in accordance with section 21, 22, 1D of the procurement bylaw and as described in this report. Is that item carried? Great. Great. All right. Carried. Thank you. Now that brings us to the end of our regular agenda. We do have, I mentioned at the start of this meeting, a motion. It's worked its way down my inbox. Um, to add an item for discussion uh, with a subsequent direction of staff. Uh, so the item to be added, because I can't just bring forward a direction without actually having an item on the agenda. Uh, the item to be added would be a, an update on the city's response to a gypsy moth situation. I don't really have a motion to add it, to be fair. But... Um, can I approve the addition, the additional item as item five on the agenda? Yeah, approved. All right, thank Great. you. And and then with that, uh, we have a direction to staff. And I believe this is coming from, there's no name on this report in front of me, on, but I believe it's coming from uh, Councillor King. Yes, it is, Chair. Okay, did you want to go ahead and introduce your the direction? Absolutely. Well, as we know, um, the city has been affected by uh, the infestation of uh, moth caterpillars. Uh, they've been uh, very voracious and uh, they've been um, um, really in multiple uh, neighborhoods uh, throughout uh, my ward and I know throughout the city. And uh, we've heard uh, much concern from uh, residents to, to ensure that the city on a go forward basis um, has a strategy and plan with dealing with infestations. We know, uh, according to some of the reports that I've received from city staff, that uh, we're, we're probably now at the end of, of this infestation, but we know uh, with uh, climate change and with the waves of infestations that happen that it, we most likely will be seeing a reappearance of uh, the moths next year. So as a result, um, listening to uh, both uh, citywide organizations and as well concerned community organizations uh, within my ward, uh, I've uh, uh, brought a uh, direction uh, to staff uh, for uh, the committee's consideration. Whereas Ottawa's tree canopy is an important asset in combating climate change and supporting the physical and mental health of residents. And whereas Ottawa has experienced a, a moth infestation at higher, uh, at higher than anticipated rates in 2021, defoliating many mature trees on both public and private property. And whereas it is expected that uh, the moth infestations will also be significant in the next several years. And whereas community participation and education will be a vital part of any effective management strategy, therefore be it resolved that city staff update standing committee on environmental protection, water and waste management in, in Q4 2021, on uh, moth impacts and to develop a response plan for moths in Ottawa that include communication of best practices and mitigation supports to residents and community groups and include any potential budget pressures that may be associated. Be it further resolved that city staff as part of the urban forest management plan that is coming to council in Q1 2022, include an update on current forestry initiatives to increase and diversify the urban canopy. All right, thank you for that. I do know that I think staff were obviously engaged in this uh, prior to today. And I, I had seen, I, I'm aware that our forestry services staff were not able to to attend this committee meeting today. Uh, I know Kevin Wiley is here. I remember seeing an update from Jason Pollard, attributed to Jason Pollard um, not that long ago on this subject, speaking to uh, plans toward 2022 to to discuss that further. I know the city was helping out uh, community volunteer groups um, 
with this situation throughout the city. So Kevin, did you just want to provide a quick response? Obviously we'll accept the direction here uh, from, from Councillor King, but just wanted to uh, get an update from you, just uh, some comments. Yeah, certainly chair. Uh, it was on staff's radar last year. Um, as we know, it was uh, predominant in Southern Ontario. Uh, we saw it in Lanark County. I think what's probably exasperated it coming to Ottawa is the dry weather. Uh, we've had a lot of winds lately and that hasn't helped. Um, staff are working on mitigating strategies, both uh, at the city level and also uh, suggestions. And we'll have a education campaign on our website for residents, how they can combat uh, gypsy mops in their, in their, on their trees as well. So we'll be coming forward uh, with that in, uh, in time for 2022 for the, the season, as you pointed out, uh, or as, as I think Councillor King pointed out, we're at the end of the cycle now for this year. Um, and uh, we have also identified a budget pressure. We're, we're preparing for our, our budget deliberations. We've already identified a budget pressure in our budget submissions that uh, we'll be uh, coming forward with. You know, the other thing to keep in mind, I know it's it's quite dramatic when residents see the, the, the devastation of our, of our canopy, um, but trees are resilient and, and I'm not the expert, but uh, the forestry experts tell me that um, uh, some, some species of trees will relief uh, this season, uh, other species of trees will relief next season. So it's, it's not that, you know, if residents are seeing some of the devastation, it's not that it's killing the trees, the, they will regenerate. Uh, but having said that, we have to be proactive and we'll be coming forward with the strategy. And I, I thank Councillor King for his motion or his direction. Thanks, and I think um, I know Councillor Menard was involved in that discussion as well. So appreciate that, Kevin and uh, Councillor King, uh, Councillor Menard. So we staff, of course, obviously accept that direction from the councillor. Doesn't need to be voted on. So thank you. Uh, just slide back to my agenda. Just uh, chair, if I could. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Quick, uh, thank you. Just a quick question to staff. It, it, the I'm seeing the the burlap all over the trees in my ward, um, in my well, pretty much all my parks, um, and a lot of my residents taking action that way. I just, if there's one piece of advice you could give to residents now, I, I know we're kind of more at the tail end of this, uh, but if there's a piece of advice staff could give to to residents. What would that be to, to help combat this if they have the, the the means, the time, and the ability to do it? Um, and because you know, certainly sending out a lit, uh, newsletters. I see our own. We got our own site on uh, on these moths. I think LDD moths is the is the term people are using. But um, uh, that's something that um, I'm hoping we can point out to the public uh, what they can do and and where we can point them to. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chair. Wrapping, uh, obviously wrapping uh, with burlap is effective. Spraying with uh, soapy water also is, 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 when you have clusters of them is also effective. Um, and ag again, I'm not the expert, so I'll, I'll defer to my forestry staff uh, when I get a chance to touch base with them and we can forward, you know, maybe some, some good uh, advice for uh, residents to combat what when they see them in their in their uh, either parks or in their in their property okay thanks very much Kevin. Okay. thank you why are they known as gypsy moss hmm. yeah and that's a common term yeah but but, but um i just wonder why yeah yeah they, i think ldd moths is uh terminology we're moving towards so. It's fascinating. There's a, on the Wikipedia page, there's a, a map showing its spread between 1900 and 2007, as it just moves from Massachusetts and just shoots out all across uh, Northeastern United States. Wild. All right. We're always learning new things here. That's the great thing about this community. Wait, right, well, thank you uh, for that. Uh, we have no in-camera items. Do we ever? Uh, notices of motion. Notice of motion, Councilor Menard. Yes, sure, you do. Don't you have a notice of motion? I do have a notice of motion. <laughs> I almost flew right by you there. It's a long meeting. Thank you. Um, it's been a good meeting, though. Uh, yes, let me uh, 
Chris, are you able to get that up on screen? I've got that here uh, in mine. I just want to make sure we got. You'll have it up momentarily. Thanks very much. It's a notice the motion to transition the environment community to a dictatorship run by me. I appreciate the support. <laughs> That's not already the case. <laughs> Uh, you you renamed it after all. So, <laughs> um, okay. All right. Thanks very much, Chair. So yeah, I'll, I'll read through this. It's notice, so it won't be till next meeting, which I understand is September, I believe. Um, it's first. Okay. Do you, uh, shall I go through the entire thing or just the beat resolves? Well, no, it's notice of motion. So, I mean, obviously you can just introduce it really quickly and just read the, read the, the resolution at the end. Okay. So just to, just to introduce it, um, it's a motion around the, the phase out of um, uh, the gas plants uh, in Ontario, gas fired power plants. Um, and um, it's speaking, there's been, I believe 29 other municipalities in Ontario have passed similar motions. Uh, it speaks to our climate change uh, plan, our, our climate emergency, it, it, it is in line, the motion would help us try to meet our goals. Um, and in line with our own uh, climate change uh, master plan. So I understand there's there's staff support and uh, I'll just read the uh, therefore be it resolves, Chris, at the end. Um, therefore be it resolved that the city of Ottawa requests the government of Ontario develop and implement a plan to phase out gas fired electricity generation by 2030 to help the city of Ottawa, the province of Ontario and the government of Canada meet their climate targets and, and uh, be it further resolved that the city of Ottawa call on the ISO to give full consideration to wind and solar, demand response, Quebec hydro and conservation, and be it further resolved that this resolution be sent to the Premier of Ontario, the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, the Minister of Health, all local MPPs and MPs, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Ontario Big Sea Meters, uh, FCM, and the and AMO. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. So obviously that's on the power generation situation in the province of Ontario. Um, so that'll come back to, again, that'll be in front of committee uh, in September. So this fall, uh, I know I've had discussions about that previously with Hydro Ottawa, so they might have some comment on it, but I mean, they're obviously welcome to, to attend committee and discuss, uh, provide comment on that when the time comes. Uh, I noticed the motion, I'm not aware of any inquiries, also not aware of any inquiries other business. Uh, I will just say another business. Um, we have some applications every now and then that kind of cross committee lines. And I know uh, Councillor Brockington and Councillor Deans um, have been working on an application on Hunt Club Road, where someone literally wants to pave down a, a forested paradise to build a parking lot. Um, no other purpose than to build a parking lot. There's no functionality to the property whatsoever. There's no building on the site. It's just paving a forest to build a parking lot. And I know just through my role as chair of this committee, obviously our our primary concern with the urban tree canopy and trying to increase the tree canopy, not trying to uh, destroy it. Uh, so we've I've had some discussions with with our planning team on that and think that staff were fully prepared to refuse the application, but I do know that um, the counselors involved and Councillor Bockington, because he's here, um, has been involved in that too, to try to find ways to preserve that, that piece of land. That's, you know, it's a, it's a good mature forest within the city of Ottawa and it's on airport lands. So one would hope that we can work with the airport to find a better solution than what, than what is being proposed from the car dealership. So thank you um, for that. I just thought I'd toss it in there another business because it does kind of apply. It's not something that comes to our committee, but it does something that applies to some of the work that we do here that often touches committees, other committees throughout the city, uh, which is not uncommon. So thank you uh, to that. Uh, on adjournments. Adjourned. So we have, again, our next meeting is Tuesday, September 21st, 2021. And we are doing a media availability uh, I believe it's supposed to start 15 minutes after this. So, but uh, staff will be in, in touch with the media who wish to engage. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, your day. Enjoy your week. Um, don't forget to toss out some orange there on, on Canada Day. Well, it seems like an odd choice, but fitting this year. So again, take care. Enjoy. <laughs>